welcome. I got your attention. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we've been standing up here long enough with you all staring at us and us staring at you. Uh, my name is Ben Hurl. I'm the Director of Victorian UFO Action. And this is Lana Basie, who is our MC for the day. So we'll both be guiding you through what is going to be, without doubt, one of the best days uh, in UFO history in Melbourne, I'm sure. And it's fantastic to see UFO events happening here. It really is. And I really want to thank each and every one of you who's warming a seat right now. Because there's another 30 people outside who also want to warm seats as well. So I think it's just fantastic to see that. I'd love to welcome all the, all the witnesses as well who are here, our panel, and plus other witnesses who may be scattered amongst the audience. Uh, and I'd like to welcome Rosie and Shane also, and the fellow team who have done a great job in getting this set up. So there's one thing I want to talk about first of all, and that's a particular date. 6th of April, 1966. Oh. <laughs> there's a lot of sixes in that date. Where were you on the 6th of April, 1966? I wasn't born. So I missed out on all the fun. And I really rue that fact that I was not even, uh, uh, nowhere near a twin in the day as I at that particular point in time. I wish I could say that. <laughs> so, it's, so, so that date is, is a very important date. And it's, it's not just because it's the Westall uh, date it's actually smack in the middle of one of Victoria's best UFO flaps that ever occurred. Two key flaps in our history, and that was 1966, with these guys at a front row seat for, and 1978. There have been two times when UFOs have really been around. So I just want to contextualise for you a little bit without sticking the microphone too much, that on this particular day, 2nd of April 1966, it all began. And what happened on that day was a young man was at his parents' house taking photographs of the garden for the renovation that they were doing. And above his house appeared a silver disc. Wow, silver disc above his house. He took, he took a photo of that disc. And that appeared in the Herald Sun. That really kicked off what was to be a really, truly strange time in Victoria. Then two days later, on the 4th of April 1966, a lovely man called Ron Sullivan was driving in central Victoria from his home in Maryborough up to Witchy Proof. And he had a strange encounter as well. Two days after the photo was taken, he encountered a brilliantly lit object that bent the headlights of his car off the road. Wow. Two days after that, on the 6th of April, well, you guys got a great big shock <laughs> when in the mid-morning something appeared in the skies. So, what was happening at that time? Yeah, this, these stories are, are true stories that are from Victoria's UFO history. And the state has a truly rich UFO history. You say, where do UFOs appear? They appear everywhere. And I'm not saying that like a nutter with a tinfoil hat. If you study the record, you study the history, you'll see that UFOs have appeared literally everywhere. And people like myself and other people in this room, we know this because we've read through all the old newspaper clippings and we've done all that work. And other people, not just me, but other people in the past have as well. So just know that your home state, Victoria, Melbourne, East Gippsland, Bendigo, everywhere has got a really rich UFO history. And I fully encourage every person in this room wanting a seat to delve into Victoria's UFO history because it absolutely is fantastic. So, Westall, why is it relevant now? I think it's as relevant now, 50 years after the fact, as it was when it actually occurred. Imagine if it occurred today. Imagine it. Imagine if you could take these teenagers from 1966 and transplant them into the year 2017 with their iPads and their mobile phones and their gen whatever it is attitudes and all that, <laughs> all that sort of stuff. Imagine it now if it occurred today. There'd be hundreds of photographs of those objects out there. The authorities could not possibly contain that in this day and age. So, and I, I can see no reason 
why this cannot occur again. I can see no reason for it. You know, these objects have appeared in our skies with apparent impunity. They have hovered over a school, for crying out loud. Where were they? What did, where did they come from? Who or what, if anything, was piloting them? These are important questions. Why, and then back in 1966, everybody had that, yes, sir, don't worry, sir, authority, rule, sir, we'll be, you know, we'll be quiet, sir, all that sort of stuff, because that was the era, that was the time. Now I reckon if the government authorities come to you, it would be very hard to keep people quieter in this day and age. The, the social networks are a lot broader now. So this is relevant now. It's not some old 50-year year UFO case that, that, that you know, we shouldn't be interested in, because it is. It's as relevant now as it was, as it was back then. So, and the story itself is that, I think it's an enchanting story myself, I really do. When you think that you've got something unusual, something strange, something not a part of our everyday world has come and interacted with what could be any one of us in suburban Melbourne on an ordinary day. That to me is absolutely incredible and it shows that the dimensionality to our universe is truly amazing. And I just wish they'd come back. <laughs> And look, guys, I want to say this day is for the public. So the guys at the front row here have had the experience, and we have the filmmakers here and the researchers here. But this is your day. This is, and that's why you guys jumped at the opportunity to come along here. If, if you really want to get the chance to talk to the witnesses, ask the questions that you want to ask, now's your opportunity to do that. And I encourage you all to do that. And I encourage you to talk to the person next to you as well. So, you know, we're all here because we all share the same fascination, whether we're here as experiences or we're just plain interested. So I really encourage you today to, to make the most of this opportunity because you've got 100% genuine people here who've had 100% genuine, real experience. So now's your chance to, to have a chat with them. Okay, that might have set the mood. Now I'd like to introduce Lana to run through the format of the day and to point out a few other logistic things as well. Thanks Ben. That's alright. Today um, the format will be divided into three main parts. Um, we'll be screening the film shortly and after the film we'll have Shane and Rosie um, giving a brief talk um, about the film. Second part of the day will be discussion with the panel, um, they'll be giving a few minutes um, talk about their experiences and talk amongst each other. Um, and the final part of the day will be uh, question and answer time. So it's your opportunity as you watch the movie, if there's something there that you'd like to explore further, um, that'll be the time then that you can uh, put your hand up and hopefully you'll be able to ask your question and have an answer. Um, there's a few housekeeping things that I need to go over. Firstly, please turn your phones off if you'd like to do that now. Secondly, um, toilets, if you didn't see them, they're just as you head back out uh, when you came in, they're on the left hand side. And in the unexpected um, <laughs> hailstorm, um, fire, earthquake, wow. emergency exit signs of a little green van there, if there's a UFO landing, the ceiling will open and we'll all take it up. <laughs> um, and back to you, Ben Bernard, just to introduce the film. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, so we, we had this experience that occurred on the 6th of April 1966, and it, it kind of it got lost in over the preceding years to a certain extent. It became a kind of bit of an urban legend. If you were even if you were interested to find out the information, there really wasn't much out there. So, you know, so it, it was getting lost to time, and that's what happens to so many UFO reports. And part of what we do is we love to get out there and find those good old classics, and we like to breathe life into them again. Uh, it's important to do that. So, so Shane started a um, a group and, and was endeavouring. He'll explain it further. To, to, to bring this is out, to start, to start piecing together what actually happened at Westall. Uh, the story is fantastic. So he started that and slowly, slowly, 
people started popping up, and then more people started popping up, and more people started popping up. And uh, an article appeared in The Age, and Rosie read that article and became fascinated with the story as well. And I won't go into too much of that because I think there's people who know more about it than I do who can, who can explain that to you. But from that point, they began a journey of hardcore research to try and find more witnesses, the people in authority, the media reports of the day. They worked tirelessly over a long period of time to, to bring all of that out. You cannot, UFO investigation is not glamorous, it's not the X-Files. A lot of it really is digging into things and trying to find things, and they did a really good job of doing that. And I think the resulting film itself is a beautiful capturing of that essential, almost fairy tale story of children's experiences with something else out there, whether it be aliens or fairies or whatever. It captures at its essence a true story. And I think that's great. And the way that the uh, that it's presented by Shane is, is fantastic. The animation doesn't take anything away from the women's story and it's not, a, it's not a cheesy recreation where you're looking at some 12-year-old who looks nothing like Joy, for example. So the animation helps to bring that storybook type of a feel to it. Uh, the music is very haunting. The way that one presents it is fantastic. Hands up if you have not seen the film. Okay, so there's a... There's a significant number of, it actually surprises me actually, I thought that there would have been more people who have seen it, and obviously some people have. So, without me going on much more, really watch this today and get the feel of that story, the, um, the, the beautiful storytelling that is at the heart of the story. So, without any further ado, get your popcorn ready, and we'll start it off with Thank you. for the movie and Shane is the presenter and researcher for the movie. very much everybody and what a great crowd we have here today. I'd like to start with a quotation from a Melbourne academic who has an ongoing interest in the Westall story. We can easily change or refine most of our beliefs since nothing too much hangs upon them. Yesterday I supposed it was going to rain today, today I see I was wrong. I submit, revise, 
My web of beliefs is basically untouched. We all move on. But the links and lines of these webs reach downwards or inwards to our very basic, often unexamined views about the world and ourselves. These are beliefs we are much more reluctant to seed since a good deal more of our sense of the way the world is, if not our very identities, rests upon them. And sometimes, history tells, people have experiences that challenge not simply their least important passing convictions. These experiences, traumatic and transform transformative, shape their most basic beliefs about themselves and the world. In such cases, a person's web of beliefs is ripped open or its moorings cut loose. It is not so easy just to move on. And that was Matthew Sharp, Associate Professor of Philosophy at Deakin University, in an article he wrote on theconversation.com on the occasion of the Westall Incidents anniversary, 50th anniversary, last year. Serious students of the UFO phenomena know that there have been so many UFO incidents in so many places around the world over so many years and involving so many witnesses that for them it becomes intellectually untenable to say that nothing important is going on. However, the phenomenon is fleeting, unexpected, unpredictable and reluctant to leave much, if anything, in the way of tangible physical evidence for science to examine. In fact, this penchant for mostly refusing to linger long in the lenses of still or video cameras, telescopes or microscopes has become one of the defining and frustrating characteristics of the UFO phenomena. It's what provides debunkers of the phenomena with their ammunition, even if they are mostly shooting with blanks for as long as they approach even the most generally intriguing cases with a scepticism that seems more akin to religious fervour than scientific inquiry. In contrast are the serious, well-informed and open-minded UFO researchers who approach the subject from whatever perspectives best reflect their personalities, qualifications and backgrounds, be they scientific, technological, philosophical, historical, even theological. For the latter group, the best of the UFO researchers who do not have any barrows to push and who know their limits and the importance both of an open but informed mind and of a healthy scepticism, the consensus seems to be that the UFO phenomenon presents a very real challenge with the potential for the most serious of implications at so many levels of society but which remains an as yet unsolved mystery. As with so many things in life, how one views the UFO mystery, and even if one considers it to be so, comes down to one's basic view of the world. One thing that might have a major influence on that, of course, is if one actually encounters a UFO, or several hundred people who have. Seeing, sometimes listening even, is believing. And that's precisely what happened at Westall in the then, then far eastern suburbs of Melbourne, when one or more flying saucers appeared literally out of the blue over two schools in plain view of some 300 people at around 10.15 in the morning. 300 people who were going about their regular routine as school students and teachers, local workers and residents, when the ordinary calm of that cool, still autumn morning was shattered by the silent presence of the incongruous in the skies above and on the grounds adjacent to the Westall schools. Followed then by the torrent of excitement and activity as witnesses and the school and government authorities reacted to that mysterious intrusion into their day. Whoever wanted the Westall story to stay in Westall and for whatever reason pretty much got their way. After appearing on the Channel 9 TV news in Melbourne that night and in a brief article in the Age newspaper, Melbourne's respected broadsheet newspaper, but not oddly in the tabloids, and then two front page articles in the Dandenong Journal local newspaper, the story went firmly under the rug. 
And there it stayed for mostly 40 years until I began my research into the case and after making contact with around 200 witnesses, generated new interest in the incident and the experiences of the hundreds of, hundreds of people who were there, literally hundreds of people. This led to Rosie's documentary, Westall 66, A Suburban UFO Mystery, which was broadcast on TV in Australia in 2010 and at several film festivals in Australia, Germany, Greece and the USA. If you haven't done so already, may I recommend that you read the two Westall 66 study guides which accompany this film and the Westall 66 video book with 30 minutes of previously unseen footage, all available at the Westall 66 website. In 2013, two important Westall incident-related events also occurred. In September, Westall Secondary College celebrated its 50th anniversary, and now, as a school community, it has firmly embraced the Flying Saucer incident as part of its history. The school invited me and Rosie to attend the reunion and to staff a stall where people could learn more about the incident and the documentary and where witnesses new and old could come and talk with us. In addition to the many witnesses that we had already met and who came to speak with us, some 10 new witnesses came and shared their memories of what had happened. These included a man with an older sister who, after the Westall 66 documentary screened, told her parents and siblings for the first time that she had been a witness and that her whole class had been spoken to and warned to keep quiet about what they had seen. And she had obeyed. Another man recalled raising the story of the incident in class at Westall High five years later, and this resulted in the deputy headmaster and another senior teacher coming to the classroom, hauling him down to the deputy's office and grilling him on why he was asking questions about the incident. He later went on to become a teacher himself and he has often wondered over the years what could possibly have caused such an over-the-top reaction, which left him genuinely shaken to a seemingly innocent inquiry. Fortunately, the atmosphere at the reunion day was different and in fact when the school released a music CD to commemorate the anniversary, they included images of a flying saucer in the cover art and the sound of a flying saucer taking off at the end of the reunion song. <laughs> Similarly, Westall State, now primary school, has also embraced the Westall incident and made their premises available for a reunion for Westall witnesses in 2011 on the occasion of the 45th anniversary of the incident. The primary school marked its 50th anniversary that year as well and also had a display on the flying saucer incident and invited me to write an article about it for inclusion in their anniversary booklet and that's now available at the primary school's website. And lastly, the icing on the cake. In 2011, I wrote to the Kingston City Council, the local government area which includes Westall, recommending that some commemoration of the Westall incident be placed at the Grange Reserve, at the location of the landing, perhaps in the form of an artwork or signage. Earlier, the City of Kingston had supported my research by publishing an article I had written on their historical website it's a good overview of the Westall story and I recommend it to you. After considering my request, the council agreed and then exceeded all expectations when they decided to completely redevelop the playground there into Australia's first UFO themed playground, <laughs> incorporating interpretive signage that would tell the story of the Westall incident using primary sources from the time and the accounts of some of the witnesses. The centrepiece of the playground is a flying saucer lit at night, which was built to reflect the descriptions given at the time. For me, as a researcher, it was the culmination of eight years of work always focused on bringing this flying, flying saucer mystery story to light and on providing recognition for the people who were there so that one day we could find answers for them about what they saw and why they were never told to speak about it. Before concluding, 
I would like you all to imagine now that you are all back at the Grange. And I will share with you what I said there at the playground's opening. I sometimes wonder how many people passing under or by that sign at the entrance over there which says the Grange know that Grange refers to a farmhouse or country home and that indeed such a thing existed here for a very long time but that was of course a time long before high tension power lines and soccer grounds with light towers and suburban houses with double garages and yet it did exist as did the very lives of the people who were there and on the other farms nearby. What has become of their memories and of those before them, I often wonder. In a similar way, more recently, but still 51 years ago now, on a cool and sunny autumn day here in this very grange, surrounded by trees of pine and gum and heath and fields brimming with blackberries and vegetables and fruit and paddocks of tussocky grass, some more memories, memories of something quite unexpected, were created in the lives of hundreds of people who came to be working and living and studying in this place known as Westall and Clayton South. Twelve years ago, in 2005, in faraway Canberra, I asked myself, were those memories real? And if so, what did they actually consist of? And what had become of them? As my contact with the people who saw the flying saucer and all the evidence it left behind grew from 1 to 10 to 100 to the current 200 plus I have been in contact with, I learned that the memories were very real indeed, that the memories were of an object aptly described by that evocative phrase from another time, flying saucer, and that the memories had certainly survived but in most cases had been hidden away out of fear of ridicule, or of disbelief, or of damage to a reputation, or in some cases, because of fear itself. Today, in this place, the Grange, with its many layers of history, the memories of the, uh, this particular and most unusual historical event, and the people who were part of it, are finally given the recognition they deserve. Truth will always prosper, but in its own strange time, perhaps. And I want to say thank you to the Westall Flying Saucer witnesses. Your memories are, and always have been, yours to preserve, and not for anyone else to prohibit, or deny, or take away. And so, for all these reasons, the Westall research continues. Several Melbourne-based filmmakers are, or have expressed an interest in doing a, a mini-series for TV, a feature-length film, a feature-length documentary about the Westall story. And people outside Australia, UFO researchers and filmmakers, are continuing to discover this amazing, almost forgotten UFO mystery story from this city's past. And we all wait in hope for that day when one person, or some people, who hold the key to unlocking the Westall mystery, make the brave and overdue decision to come forward and tell the truth. For a UFO event like the 1966 Westall incident, which had the audacity to occur in broad daylight in front of so many innocent and unexpecting eyes, and followed by such a forceful response, 51 years has been far too long to wait. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shane. Uh, we're just going to do a little stage reshuffle now just so we can prepare for the next part of it, which is going to be an interview with Shane and Rosie. So just bear with us while we do a little bit of housekeeping. Talk among yourselves. <laughs> So, so I'd like to uh, give a brief introduction to uh, George Simpson. 
who many of you may or may not know. George is a long time uh, Victorian UFO researcher. Uh, he's been with the old U Force back in the back in the day. Uh, was a committee member with them. Uh, he's had a, been around UFOs for, for quite a long time. Uh, he's the director of AU Corn in Victoria, and he's also a regular contributor to the Ufologist magazine. And I do encourage anyone out there interested in UFOs to look up the Ufologist the Australian magazine. So uh, we're going to have George come out, and he will have a discussion with Shane and Rosie about the film. So I'd like to welcome to the stage George. Because a lot of people contacted the website 
and came out of all the work and said, yeah, we want to talk about this now. Um, did you have trouble any sort of difficulty or any sort of, um, what, what was the idea that made you set up that website? What, what was your interest in the subject? Because then you're an academic, you're in Canberra, and you're following your career, and all of a sudden, you know, if you, the subject is looked upon with a lot of ridicule, um, so why did you take that risk? Well, George, you're too young to know this, but uh, such a thing as a midlife crisis. <laughs> and uh, I was having an early midlife crisis. And I was very keen to write a book, as sometimes people are, and sometimes people achieve even. Mm -hmm. and, and that's right, exactly, I saw it a few years after me. Uh, I wanted to write a book, a book for children. And I remember, and I don't know the mechanics of how this happened, it's still a little bit of a mystery to me even. I remember completely out of the blue that there had been this blind saucer story West for many years ago and I had heard of it when I first lived in Melbourne long before I moved to Canberra. And so I looked it up. There wasn't very much written about it. And I read the bare bones of the story and thought, wow, I wonder what actually happened. Could that have been Bill Jordan's book or something? Because he did a few pages on it in his book. That's yeah. the only thing I know That's of right. so I think it was actually John Pinkney's book. Oh, okay. John Pinkney. Uh, wrote about we still had a couple of sections in his book about yeah. West. I think it was there. Mm -hmm. um, of course, Bill also covered it as well. Right. So that was the inspiration when I wrote book for children. I thought this was a great story, and it would be a story that would go into schools. Kids would read it because it had it added setting schools involved kids and teachers. And so then I set up a Yahoo Groups website. This is back in the day before social media had started, and it attracted some interest. I got some attention in the local media around Westall, and people contacted me. And as I, I contacted one witness, that would lead to two, and that would lead to four, and it snowballed. Well, it was a brilliant idea because it really brought a lot of the witnesses that nobody else could find. Um, I used to run these at appropriate meetings, and people would come to me and go to the CBS store on my home and talk about that the CBS store had more UFO stuff than anybody else. Why was that? Because the guy who ran the video saw was one of the kids at the school on the day. So he had a lot more UFO videos than any other video store. That was in Cleveland. And he mentioned um, some lady used to come in um, through work and uh, was one of the vets who used to come in there. And, and her name was Joy. And uh, she was one of the kids at school. I wanted to interview her. I tried for months to track it down, couldn't find it. But she came to your website and said, so, it brought it all together, it was just fantastic. And, it's a big help. and as people like Joy and all the others who are here today and lots of others who aren't contacted me, I realised this thing's true. This thing was real, this thing happened. Without being able to say what it was that happened in terms of where it came from and, and, and that continuing mystery, but then I realised I need to write a book or some articles or something that would try to find answers for the people who were there mm -hmm. as well as for myself. And so that moved towards that project, and then Rosie came along mm -hmm. and her own film project on the year of scooping up. Are you uh, at risk now of being seen in academic circles as the goal of the foil of that? Because you're so into the UFOs? Has there been any sort of feedback that you got from your peers? I think we're pretty open these days. I think it's very different these days. I don't talk much about my research when I'm at work. Mm -hmm. uh, my colleagues know about it. Some of them have seen the DVD, and mostly they're very interested, mostly they're very positive about it. It doesn't really impinge on my work. I keep the two quite separate. Well, that's really, really good to hear, because so most of the witnesses will, will tell you that um, it's, you don't often talk about it if you're a witness, because mm -hmm. you just get really cool. Mm -hmm. And you've got that risk, you know, in your career that you could be seen as that loopy UFO like, you know. Well, I don't consider myself a, a ufologist, and I don't even call myself that, and not just because it sounds like you're on this, but um, <laughs> because I'm an uh, apologist and neurologist. So, uh, um, but I, I'm not really a UFO researcher, but I'm a researcher of this story, which happens to be a story about a UFO. There's a book going. The book is a work in progress, like my life. <laughs> and um, and I think it was my two children. So I, I tried to write a book um, and I had all the things I wanted to include. I had one page at the end of sitting out for a few hours trying to write a book and I had one page. It's not a book, is it? I'll be honest with people about the book. The book, the book is something that's in progress, but it's very slow. Uh, and the reason for that is, well, there's lots of reasons, but one of the reasons is there are quite a few UFO books out there. And 
I just want to add another UFO book to the collection out there. Plus, I've always wanted to include in the book the psychic gun. Because most UFO books, of course, don't have the psychic gun. Because genuine UFO cases don't tend to have smoking guns. They don't have the answer. And I have this optimism because I'm in Australia, we live in Australia, we do things differently here, we're optimistic that at one some point someone will come forward. It may be a dead bed condition, maybe something akin to that, and they'll give us that little bit of information that will crack open the case. And as I've said to people constantly, I don't care what the answer is ultimately. It just has to be the right answer. Fantastic. Can I now move on to Rosie's involvement in the, in, in the story? How did you manage to invite Rosie into this? Again, Rosie making a documentary on your UFOs, and that's going to make you seem like a strange person in the, in the crew who's making your UFOs story. So, because the ridicule is so great, isn't it? So, um, it's good that you said um, it's not as bad as you thought it would be. So, Rosie, um, what, did you just. Um, take the story that this would be interesting to do. Um, did you have any difficulties doing this stuff? Obviously at day one when you started at that reunion and that was a fabulous start. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, tell us about it. Well actually it was me approaching Shane um, rather than Shane approaching me. So I was more concerned that Shane would say, oh, I don't think very much I'm not interested in the documentary. Really? Rather than the other way around. Yes, oh, yes. Um, also, so he yeah. persisted and, and, and uh, you know, well, batted him down to the point where he had to leave the year. Oh, he yeah, had to agree. He had no choice in the end. No, I'm very good. And there was the money, of course, as well. Oh, the huge amount of money that he oh, gave him. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I wish that was true. Um, so, your question uh, how did it begin, or why? I, I guess I personally have been interested in stories about faith and religion and I guess I saw this as a story that would I mean it excited me because it had so many unknowns really and it had um, a person at the centre of it who does have faith it had people who knew what they'd seen but were told that they hadn't seen anything uh, it had a lot of elements that were grey it was a mystery in terms of uh, what actually happened on the day and at the time that uh, although Shane had done already done a lot of work by the time I came onto the scene, not all of that was, was public so you know, it, Shane was really beginning to put all the material that he had already gathered and was gathering from people out in the public domain so it was exciting it was uncovering a story that people were, were really only just becoming brave enough to talk about and that's, I mean, I'm, I'm, it's fantastic to see so many people who were in the documentary and were there at that reunion at the very first time that Shane and I were together. Um, it's great to see so many of you here and I'm hoping that somewhere in the audience is, is somebody who knows somebody who knows the smoking gun thing. You never know, do you? Um, the holy grail. It, yeah, but, well, it, somebody will know. Um, so I guess the story itself was something that I thought was, um, well, I think it's a terrific story, I think it's a real story, and I think it has lots of um, truths for us in all sorts of other ways, so. Can I give you a little bit of a prod and ask you to uh, talk about one little part of the subject? Because uh, I know that if Ian was here, no. he, oh. oh, about the girl who um, touched the thing and got taken away in an ambulance and never came out of the school, <laughs> Just that bit about the kids who went to visit her and what happened. Would you like picking you know, up? What kids who went to visit her? Some of her friends went to visit her at home about a week later. Oh. You know that bit? Um, that story? Where and she wasn't there. And the, the people yes. answered the door said she was well, so she, 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 she never lived here. Yes, that's right. And that actually yeah. happened. I know one of the witnesses is yeah. not here today, but like that. Oh, okay. To be yes, sure. that, that happened. Because right. it's not something out of the Twilight Zone. Yes. Not something that would happen in Victoria in 1966. Sure. Well, I, I don't. I, I can't add more to that. No, I mean, you, 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 you were the one who tracked her down, didn't you, or had contact with someone? Uh, was that the time you had about her or something? I don't. I don't. I really don't want to talk about it. Oh, no. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> you shouldn't have brought it up. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, I, I, I can't talk about that right. because that person does not recall 
Oh, okay. So yes, I've had contact with somebody I suspect maybe that person, but the person doesn't remember that, so okay. uh, it's not something that I feel I'm not going to start talking about it because no, no, no. she doesn't recall it. One of the so frustrating things about it is frustrating. Frustrating. you often come across a brick wall when you're trying to find information. Yeah. It's very hard to get information. Mm. In some cases, but you don't have a name to go on, so you can't mm. begin an investigation. You don't have a name. I've been stuck in that situation for three years right now. Mm. So, you know, breakthroughs are really good when they happen. Yeah, yeah. I know that's very frustrating, but I, I, um, it's an ethical mm. thing. I'm, I'm just so glad that you made the documentary, and I'd love to see it on Freeway TV in Melbourne so that everybody would see it on their TV. So, because it's only been on cable. TV in Melbourne, as far as I'm aware. Yeah. yeah. So not everyone has Fox set. Uh, it'd be great if it's on pretty rare, so everybody can watch it. It's all over the kitchen. We need to find more next. Okay. And, and part of the shame in that is that possibly more people overseas in North America in particular have seen something about the Westall story on their TVs. Because of course more people in North America watch cable TV and the Discovery Channel Canada filmed an episode about the Western incident mm. and uh, the National Geographic Channel in the UK mm. as well. Nice choice of uh, school building that's happening. That's right. Yeah. right. So nice to do with the laughter. I have to do with the Canadian second news and the British second news. But uh, it's a shame that it wasn't able to go on public television in Australia. The Rosen tried extremely hard uh, to convince both ABC and SBS to take it on. But these things are very hard to convince people of, aren't they? Um, but it was on the Sci-Fi channel and as Rosie just said, of course, in this day and age, it's on YouTube. But <laughs> um, it's all out there. That's what we're very fortunate that we can get access to these things. Years ago, everything was just so controlled. Um, you know, in the 50s and 60s, people would get their Super 8 movie film, cameras out and they'd film things flying around. And they'd go and get them developed and then they'd never get the film back because there were people yeah, the CIA had plants in the actual photo development labs and if any of those came through, the people just said, oh no, you can turn in. They can get it back. That's right. And some people here might remember that last year on the occasion of the 50th anniversary, <coughs> uh, there was a 20 minute program on the West Story on Channel 10, on their morning program called Studio 10. And uh, that was partly hosted by Isaac Buffroves. And I just flew down from Sydney to Melbourne and did some interviews. And, uh, and I was part of putting that package together. And that was a wonderful tribute again to the Whistle story and the Whistle witnesses. Yeah, so that was, a, that was very well put together. And um, what was really interesting about that was it was treated seriously. And that's another really good thing about the documentary that you made, Rosie, is that you, the whole subject is actually treated um, objectively and seriously. And, um, that's the last thing people need is any more ridicule uh, associated with the UFO subject. So thank you very much for all your efforts making that film. I really appreciate it. It's great. <laughs> and thank you so much for getting all the witnesses back together too. This was fantastic for them to see each other again and also for us to be known now because they've been hidden for so many years. Under you again. Thank you very much. I'll take that to Okay, thank you very much, guys. We'll yep. get you to uh, exit to the stage over here. Yep. it will be great. Thank you very much. Okay, just before we break for lunch, uh, you know, today's been all about Westall uh, 66, the witnesses and the documentary. Uh, we have here someone who perhaps may be the future of uh, documentary making about UFOs in the future. I have a young girl at the side here, um, named Lily. I'd like to invite her on the stage. <laughs> Thanks for coming, Lily. No problem. Yeah, good on you. So, Lily's been shortlisted in the ACME uh, Awards. Uh, for her film, short film, yeah. and perhaps you could just give us a bit of a brief description about what your interest in UFO is and the film project. Sure. So last year I was looking into this competition, I entered, entered it before once, and it's called Screen It, 
the theme was mystery and I already knew like a little bit about UFOs because there was a sighting in my area and I was looking into it and I saw that it was the 50th anniversary of the Westall incident. So I was looking into that a bit more and I wanted to make a film about it. So I made a film about the two different incidents that happened and what would kind of go on if that if an alien incident would happen now. So like with people having phones and cameras like everywhere, it's kind of about that and the evidence and things that would happen now. So yeah. Absolutely, yeah. And, and you touched on that a little bit earlier, so it'd be a completely different scenario now if something similar occurred. Yeah, you wouldn't really be able to keep that kind of thing under wraps, like what happened with the West Door. <laughs> it, it'll just get out yeah. immediately. Yeah, the genie would be out of bottle, I'm sure. <laughs> So, so, what's the next step for your film now? Um, is it an awards night coming up? Is that oh, that was actually last year. Like, I didn't win, but I was in the finals of it. Yeah. 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 But the competition is this year, and I'm going to enter again. But the theme is different. So. Ah, because the yeah. theme was a mystery, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, that's great. Well, thank you very much. And uh, to acknowledge yeah, your, your fine work, uh, we'd like to give you and your dad some of your bow caps to wear. Thank you so much. Remind you for this day <laughs> and uh, to wish you all the best in the future. Thank you. Cheers. Okay, I'm sure everybody's uh, probably feeling relatively hungry. I'll pass it across the line. Thanks, Pete. What was she like there? I'm sure Dr. Yes, we're going to take a lunch break now for about half an hour. Uh, we've got sandwiches and coffee out in the foyer. Uh, there is a gluten-free option, you just have to look for the label. There is also uh, drinks available at the bar if you want soft drink or alcohol at bar prices. So we'll see you back in about half an hour.
1966, yeah. I was a uni student at Monash, so I was 21 years of age, and I was studying engineering. Um, I lived at Murrumbina, if any of you know where that is, that's quite a distance from Westall. Um, on the day of the, when the kids saw the UFO, uh, I had an uncle whose kids were at primary school, and in the afternoon he rings me up, I was actually home for a uni, and he said, guess what, there's the UFO just landed at the back of the school. I said, what? He said, I'm going to come down on my bike. So I rode my bike from Murrumbina <laughs> all the way down to Westall. <laughs> I, I met, my, met my uncle at the back of the school, and then my memory of what happened there, what the area was like, is nothing like what it is today. So it's, I find it very hard when I go into the Grange. I just can't relate the area. Anyway, I just remember this huge paddock of high grass, about two foot high, and I'm pushing my bike through on a path through this paddock where the kids had obviously used to run through. And as I'm pushing through my bike, I see a huddle of people. It's probably about 15 to 20 people, all in a huddle. When I get a bit closer, I see that there's Channel 9. And I know it's Channel 9 because they had one of those big outdoor cameras. The guy had it on his shoulders and had Channel 9 plainly on the side. I look down to what the people are looking at. Wow, there's this very defined circle in the two foot grass. And it was very defined because the whole circle was completely flat. But more than flat, the grass was twisted round in a radial direction as if something had come down onto the ground and twisted round. So the grass was actually twisted round. And I also remember, which I hadn't actually just, um, mentioned this before, I also distinctly remember there was three pockets where the grass was exposed down into, down into the dirt. So there were three spots and I, I recently saw a picture of what one of the um, school kids had drawn of the UFO and they looked up, up at it in the sky and they saw that it had three protrusions on the bottom and I thought, wow, that's what I remember now that I saw on the ground. Anyway, um, we looked at that and thought, wow, that's incredible. We saw it on the television that night. The next day I told some of my mates and they said, oh, let's go back. So we, both of us, we had our bikes. We did the same trip from Murrumbina. We drove down to Westall. As we got in close to the paddock, I suddenly realised, oh no, they've got a barrier around it. So I thought, oh, let's just duck under the barrier. So I'm just about to duck under, this, under the barrier to get into the paddock. And suddenly a military guy jumps up. He said, don't you come here, go away, go away, you must go away. Oh no. So we get back on our bikes and we ride all the way back home. We talk about it. About a week later I said, ah, oh, let's go back and have another look. So we go back and down, get back down to where we've seen the paddock. Oh no, the grass has been cut. But it wasn't just cut. The grass was completely, all grass was removed. In other words, it, it wasn't as if someone had gone through with a slacker and there was big heaps of grass that had been cut. No, it was nothing like that. It was just cut right down to the ground. So we walk across to where the, um, the circle, we, we see the circle, and that area was burnt. It's absolutely burnt. Oh, no. So then the next thing that, that happened with that was, I was quite uh, pissed off, to put it mildly. But over the next few days, in all the papers, they were saying uh, the kids saw a high-altitude balloon was in the area. That's what they saw. No, this is not right. So I then wrote a series of letters to the newspapers, and I think it was the Herald Sun and the Argus. And I also then discovered that there was the Victorian UFO Society at the time. So I wrote a letter to them. Um, didn't hear any more about this until about 10 years ago. I get a phone call from this lady called Rosie Jones. She says, I'm with the ABC uh, documentary producer. Um, are you Kevin Hurley? You, saw it, you, you were involved in the UFO site in 1966. I said, yeah, that's me. <laughs> she actually found the article that I wrote to the Victorian UFO Society. So since that I've been quite involved in all these various uh, 
Thanks. Thanks, Kevin. That's right. Thank you for sharing that with us. It's a very compelling uh, experience. Now I'd like to pass it across to Dee. Hi, everybody. Um, I wasn't with the Western High School students. Um, I was at Clayton North Primary School, and back then I was only seven years and four months old. And um, <laughs> <laughs> I, remember play- I remember playing in the playground and just looking, and it was a clear day, and, um, and I looked up in the sky and I could see this. I thought it was a plane, but it didn't have a tail. And um, so I, can't, I was looking at it and I thought, there's no tail on that plane. So I just followed it with my eyes and it came around and then all of a sudden it just, so it was just straight like this and um, and then it just went on its side like that, which was like that, so I could see the top of it and then it just went off. And it was silver and round. And um, that's all I saw. Um, Another girl in the playground saw it as well, and I asked her, when we go inside, let's tell the teacher. And she said, yeah, okay. But then when we lined up to go in, and she said, I'm not telling anyone. I'm not. And, uh, so I didn't tell anyone either. And um, only being so small. And uh, I, my, mum, my mum said I told her many, many years later. I don't remember telling her. She didn't do anything. She was a new Australian to the country. I didn't have any siblings or... You know, so I just kept it to myself, and then many, many years later, I told my children that I do believe in oh, now UFOs. Back then, it was flying saucers, um, and they grew up with that because even my daughter of 36 believes and knows about today, which is good. And then I was in a waiting room with my mother, who has passed away many years ago now, and um, waiting for her. And I picked up um, a magazine, as you do, because I never buy them. And um, and then I opened up, because this is 2006 copy, oh, and there was the um, Shane's, Shane's article. And that's how I got in touch with Shane. And then from there, I got in touch with George and have been part of the group and being able to validate what I saw. Mm, that's really, really fascinating. So it's a relief. It's um, like validation, but but today, and then I went to West High Primary School in two, um, in 1970, year one, form one, and I kind of asked a few students, but I knew at that time they would have been my age, so so they wouldn't have understood or believed, and I didn't ask anyone else, and um, so I left it there, um, but I knew what I what I saw. I've always maintained that. And um, until, yeah, and then this validated um, my, my, what, my belief, what I saw. And, and today, for 20 years, I've been driving to my work, and I go up Westall Road, and there's a Grange sign, Westall High School sign, and sometimes I see the kids in uniform, and then I go up on Danny on the Road past my primary school, Clayton North Primary School, and that's what I've been doing for 20 years as well. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you. Oh, well, no I'd like to say thank you for coming. I was quite gobsmacked when I turned up today because I actually wasn't going to come myself. And I thought, no, I will go along. And um, I realise now that I'm quite privileged to have actually witnessed such a phenomenon. Um, I was a a West Joel High School student. Um, I'd like to be able to say I was about four at the time, but I wasn't. I was about 11. Um, And on the day it happened, I was playing cricket out on the field. um, And... Quite a few of us noticed these three discs up in the sky, like round silver discs. And of course everybody stopped and we were all pointing at it. And then Mr Greenwood was the first teacher that came out onto the oval. So he witnessed it as well. And then one of them appeared to go down above the Grange, where is where we that's where we used to go and play our sports, our cross country runs. And I was always a bit of a daredevil at school. So I ran for the fence in the corner and jumped over. Um, and as you would have seen in the documentary, I did arrive at this uh, area where it had landed um, just as it was starting to take off. So I was actually quite close to it, probably, I believe, about three or four metres away from it. 
Um, and it, it, my memory, your memory does fade a little bit over the years, but from what I remember, it was a round silver disc like everyone else has described. It had lights underneath it. It was throwing off a light, sort of a humming noise, and I could feel some heat coming off it. So it just appeared to sort of rise up above the ground fairly slowly, and then it turned on its side and it just went bang, that's it, disappeared almost. It went up and joined the other two and they just disappeared literally. Did they so fly away or did they just like they, disappear? They, no, they, they seemed to go straight up, so they yeah. just disappeared, it was so fast. So quick. They, so quick, so I believe, that's my belief, that it definitely was something from somewhere else. I, I don't believe it was anything from um, Earth. <laughs> it was just so, they wouldn't have had anything that could move that fast. Um, so all that business about weather balloons and um, all the other things that they came up with was just rubbish. Um, we were definitely all told not to talk about it, which I think I went home and told Mum and she just thought I was being ridiculous and just forgot about it. Um, but it, it definitely was covered up. We, we were all threatened not to talk about it. Um, the news crews were all outside the school. I, I didn't talk to anyone on the news. I just went straight home and um, told Mum. So what about my story? Yeah. I just butt in. Yeah, what about the follow-up uh, the next day? Oh yes, well, actually I did leave one bit out. When I arrived at the scene where it was um, just taking off, there were two other girls. Um, one was Tanya, um, and she appeared to be fainted to me. She was on the ground, she was quite hysterical, and an ambulance arrived at the school and took her away. Now, I was friends with Tanya. She was a migrant. Um, and they didn't speak a lot of English, but I used to call into her house. We were quite good friends. And I did go to visit her the day after and was just all locked up. And I was told she'd gone, she'd moved. And they knew nothing about it. So that was all covered up as well for some reason. That's interesting, correct. So we almost takes it to, I don't know, invasion of body snatches or something. Yes. <laughs> just you know, disappearing and it's really quite, uh, it's quite disturbing, isn't it? It was disturbing. And it's I disturbing. think her family will be worried about it. Yeah. So they just didn't want to have any publicity and no. I don't know, there might have been illegal migrants, I don't know. Absolutely. Just think about that in your own point of view, your own family, if you know, if something like that happened in your own in your own house, it's uh yeah, I know ja uh, Jackie Argent. Uh, you know she uh, has released statements. It was actually on the uh, on the video, and uh, she she was very very concerned about. And, uh, and even to this day, she um, you know she does speak of that. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So on that note, I will now pass it over. Thank you very much, Terry. <laughs> now I'd like to throw it across to Colin Kelly. To, uh, to give us what it is yeah. on that day. Okay, uh, look, thanks again everybody. I uh, didn't believe there was so much interest in this and uh, we do appreciate your attendance and yeah, hearing us out. Ironically, the, um, back, in, uh, back in those school days, our, our motto with the school, which was written up on the logo and what have you, was um, t uh, three words which said integrity and service. So what you're, what you uh, the the verses you're hearing uh, here today, um, look, that integrity is uh, certainly shining through. This did happen, okay. So just keep that in mind. Uh, on that video, you uh, would have seen um, the kids running through the grange. That was our backyard. Yeah, and uh, we, we used to you know, do all the cross countries. Yeah, you would have seen a kid running there with a black single with number five on it. That was me. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't changed much. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 can I just say? Yeah, sure. Sorry, sorry, Gay. Can I just say when I got to Westall High, naughty things happened. <laughs> <laughs> they <laughs> did with <laughs> us too. <laughs> they were happening in '66 too, I think. You sure? sure. <laughs> Look, my day, uh, I still um, yeah, quite uh, remember this very vividly. Uh, I was out on the uh, the oval at the time, yeah, similar to um, Teresa here, and... Terry. Terry. <laughs> uh, I knew oh, I was going to get that reaction. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Back me up, Joy. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was out on the oval with a guy by the name of Gary Robertson. We were you know, standing side by side, and, and I actually did hear so uh, we were just talking and I did hear something, it was like a light whooshing sound uh, and th this is probably something that's uh, that 
you know, hasn't been spoken about lately, um, the, the actual noise and the sound mm. you know, that, uh, that was related. Well, I haven't heard that uh, very much, and that's probably something we need to uh, have a look at. But I had a slight whooshing sound which um, attracted my attention. I, I looked over to, uh, to over where the power lines and things are, and I saw the. Um, and once again, I've heard conjecture of uh, one UFO, I've heard three, I can tell you there were three. Okay, so um, yeah, that, that is a definite. There was one uh, slightly larger than the other two that were flanking it. Uh, we sat there and watched it. I was probably one of the, um, we, we were probably uh, two of the first people who actually did see that. And, uh, you know, look, it was, they were just up there hovering and uh, there was just a very slight buzz that you could hear from the uh, from the craft themselves, and you know obviously the, the discussion, the, the bell went, um, and all of a sudden people just flocked out onto the oval and just started beelining for the back fence. I was uh, uh, Gary Robertson, and I were, uh, just about to uh, bolt and uh, about 15 yards away from us, there was a teacher by the name of David McKay, and he just looked at us pointed out to us and he said, you two are going nowhere, stay. <laughs> and like little puppy dogs, we stayed. <laughs> but we, uh, we had a pretty good uh, view of, uh, of everything, that, of what was going on. And in the statements that I've actually made, uh, when the craft actually um, you know, went over the back to the, um, over the pine trees of the Grange, uh, I have never said that I, I saw it land, and I didn't. I saw it disappear over the back of the, uh, the pine trees. Uh, short time later, uh, it, uh, it came back, and it was you know, something that enlightened me off that um, show uh, that, that, that we've just seen. It um, was a statement that um, Victor Zakrusny had made. He's, and when they asked him, they said there were two over on the side. Uh, I initially, and I've got to plead guilty to this, uh, I actually questioned Victor's um, assumption of, uh, of the thing, but just seeing that, that prompted uh, um, something that I, I never considered. I saw one go over the, uh, over the backyard towards the Grange, what happened to the other two? So I've got to, I've got to recalculate my thoughts on, on what Victor's uh, assumption was. Um, look, we were all in different place, uh, places at the time. I know what I saw. Victor was probably in a different position to what I was. He saw something else. I've got to accept that. Yeah, I think that's why the confusion's out there about was there one, two, or three discs because people are all over the place yeah. and people saw one, two, or three discs or no discs. Yeah. So, you know, so that's, you know, it's, but, you know, I like that we sort of said here today that, you know, categorically there was three discs. Yeah. And I didn't even know that the one was larger than the other two. Yeah. So that's the, you know, was that the boss? <laughs> Look, yeah, you ask us, um, how big were they? Well, I've heard everything from eight metres to 14 metres, whatever. We were at school to learn our mathematics and we've got to calculate the hypotenuse of, uh, from where we were standing <laughs> to where the, uh, you know, the power lines were and you work out A plus B equals C and whatever. Uh, that's what we were at school. The, um, hard to say, if you, look, if you are to ask me from where I was standing, I, I would have said about 12 metres uh, in uh, the width of it, but yeah. I could be wrong. Yeah, it's hard to judge something yeah. over distance, both height and its actual size. It's not an easy thing to do. I saw it much lower than that, and yeah. I don't think it was 12 metres, I think it was about 6 metres. About 6 metres. Well, well, okay. If you've been to the playground and you've seen a recreated, beautiful little UFO that's lighting it up tonight, does that seem... Like the, size well, the circle on the ground would have given it away. Yeah. You saw the circle yeah. quite close. Kevin, what's your thoughts? What, what yeah, you well, think size-wise? At the time, I thought it was, was bigger than a car. Yeah. yeah. Bigger yeah. than a car. Could have been a car and a half size. That's what I so, thought too. Yeah. Because yeah. they were very visible to the yeah. naked eye. Yeah. Yeah. Very visible to the yeah. naked eye. Yeah. Right, well, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's right. Just keep going. Well, and I'll be... Settle, pedal. Well... I eventually did get down the Grange uh, later on. Uh, I actually, uh, when I went home, uh, I asked my mother, and my mother's still alive, and I've asked her a few questions uh, about this uh, in the last few days, and uh, she actually, uh, I, 
I said, did you ever remember me coming home and saying, um, you know, with that? And she said, I could hear you from the end of the street. <laughs> so, I said, did, did you believe me? And she said, yes, I did. Yeah. You know, so, so she believed me. Uh, but she actually, uh, something she did say to me, uh, even as late as yesterday, was that um, the popular rumour going around Clayton at the time that, the, uh, that was uh, an American um, uh, experimentation going on now, she had never ever said that to me and I never prompted that from her. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's interesting. Well, other things have happened, we can talk later, but yeah. uh, go for it, Joy. Okay, I'll pass it across to Joy. Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, Susan, Suzanne and I have a similar story, so Susie's sort of asked me to talk for her as well as myself. Uh, we were both in science at the time when the kid ran in, flung the door open, screaming about the flying saucers in the sky, and of course we all just looked at each other right and burst into laughter. And Mr Greenway said, come on, it's in, nearly the end of the period, so we'll go. So we all bolted out, down through the hallway, out past the toilets, out onto the oval, and down towards the back of the oval, where all the kids were milling around. And yes, there were flying saucers in the sky. Now Suzanne and I both um, have been back on numerous occasions, and stood in where we thought we were standing and looked and tried to, because we always felt that one was slightly bigger than the other two. Whether it was a perception of of distance or whatever, but one appeared, especially when it was up, because we saw them in the sky and then they disappeared over the back of the grange. Now, Suzanne and I both had not agreed that we think that one was maybe (coughs) slightly forward when it came back up, so it gave the perception of being bigger than the other two. Right now, um, I don't remember any of the noise that was going on because it, it took me quite, because what I was looking at, the perception of what I was looking at was something that I'd never seen before. Mm. So it took a while for it to, so I wanted to try and absorb every little detail that I possibly mm. could about what I was actually looking at because I'd never seen anything like that before. And then my most vividest memory after it when they disappeared, because they did, yes, and the aircraft came, buzz them, da da The big one came up and it just went straight up in the air, like, <laughs> turned on the side. And as it turned on the side, the sun hit the bottom of the disc and it just went, <laughs> and the other two just went, <laughs> and they were gone. <laughs> and that, that's exactly what it was like, you know, it was so quick. Yeah. And then the army came very quickly. I have a very strong recollection mm. of the army coming, coming across the road at the Hume Pipes and getting out of the Jeeps and whatever. Mm. Remember that very vividly. Also, I got interviewed by Channel 9 that night. It was on the news. Uh, and I got detention as well. <laughs> and, um, but my elder sister was, was there too, but she was around the other side of the school. She took me down. She said, we're going down to see. She said, I haven't seen it, but we're going down. Yeah. And we went down to the circle and she, we just crossed the road. The dirt was a dirt road between the primary school and the Grange. And we went in and she can remember as clear as a bell too that the grass all flattened, but we did get frightened because there were um, army people and that in there. So she said, come on, come on, we've got to go, we've got to go. But it was funny talking about Paul Dean. Um, I actually got interviewed at home twice. They came to our house twice. Norman. Paul Norman, yeah. sorry. Paul. It's all right, I'm a senior. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, Paul Norman came to the house twice. Now, we didn't even have the telephone on in those days, so I have no idea how they got our... our um, you know, address or whatever. But he came to the house and, and we sat around the table and I had to draw photos and my sister told them what she'd seen and, and whatever else. So, and then um, my father at the time was working at government aircraft factories yep. and he was making Ginevix and Mirages and whatever else and he was working down at Avalon quite a lot from Springvale, so he used to travel every day down there. And he came home, I must put into, my parents were very supportive. They didn't make fun of me or laugh at me. It was very lucky. It was only all the stuff at school about me, you know, don't talk about it, it's a weather balloon, you're massively hysterical, you know, whatever else. Um, Dad came home from work, it was about a month later, and said there's to be no more talk of the UFO. Now, I don't, unfortunately, my dad's passed, so I can't ask him whether he was just being a protective parent or, um, he'd been told from his end to, you know, put a hush-hush on or just to, to put it down. 
But uh, my personal belief is that what I saw was something out of this world. I've never seen anything since. It's, I wish I would, because it was the most exciting thing that's ever happened to me in my life. And it's in my head, and I cannot get it out. No matter, I can submerge it, I can put it away for a while, but you dr I drive past there, and the hair stands up on the back of my neck, and it's bunk, it's there, yeah. Inst instantly, yeah. instantly. That's very similar to Ron Sullivan, who had the encounter very slow. He, he is exactly the same way. What he saw was incredible, it was amazing, it saved his entire life. Uh, and obviously that's the case for everybody sitting here, and uh, people Right. Yeah, like I said, Suzanne and I have been back there quite a few times and just sort of tried to, you know, to, what do you think? Do you think it was over there, you know, was it close yeah. or for just to sort of try and get in, in perhaps a bit of perspective of whether there were two smaller ones yeah. or whether it was just a distance or whatever. Right. I just want to ask a quick question. How many of you saw the aircraft, the, the, the Cessnas up yeah. there? Yeah. So sure. every, a lot of people saw that. Yeah. Did you have anything else to add, Joy? No, no, yeah. this is just to say, I just say to people, um, I don't have an issue, I've had issues over the years with being criticised when yeah. it started to come out, you know, I had drunk with you, had drugged with you, da da da. Yeah. I was 12 and a half, for God's sake. <laughs> I was at school, you know, you stepped over the line, you got whack, you know, there was none of this. How, who do you think you are, business? Yeah, no, no, it didn't work that way. And and I had an argument with a young fellow. He said, no, no, it wouldn't happen, couldn't happen, da da da. And I said, look, I have one question for you, Luke. He said, what's that? I said, well, were you there? And he said, no. And I said, well, I was. Yeah. End of story. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for that. It's really good stuff, guys. Thank you so much for that. So now I'd like to Paul pass across to Paul Smith. Now Paul was perhaps a little older than than the <laughs> other uh, students here at the school, because Paul, in fact, wasn't at the school. He was working hard in the in the field next door, getting things ready for market. And he was about 16 years old. I was. I was 16. 16. So he's a little bit older. Uh, and. I've interviewed Paul before, and, and uh, very, very much in, enjoy his his experience. So I'd like to pass across to you, Paul. Okay, no worries. I was I was 16 years old, and uh, wasn't expecting anything. That it was supposed to be just a normal day loading up for market. But um, about 11, between 11 and 11:30, um, I just happened to look up. And it was just there in front of me. There was an opening between the trees, the pine trees in grade, and the land, which was a lot lower. The trees were a lot lower over there. And there was an opening. And it was just sitting there, about 20 feet above the ground, not far at all. But I heard no sound from it. It was just glowing. It was a sort of whitish silver. And then it was as if it had been observing what was going on and because I spotted it, it started changing. And the colour changed, it seemed to tip on its side a bit and then the colour started to become more bluey, greeny, mauvey and it was fading, it became translucent. Uh, it was a solid object to start with that went from translucent, transparent, you could see through it, and then it went like there was just this resonance left, like a gas or fumes or something, and that just moved around and it went into the trees, into the pine trees. But the trees didn't move. It wasn't a solid object going through there. It was some sort of residue or gas that went into the trees. There was nothing left of it. And my boss was there, he stood up, looked around, and um, he saw the tail end of what was happening, but didn't look particularly interested, and he turned around and went back to work again. But the next day, uh, an army guy came up in a jeep from the paddock where the um, circles were observed. And he came up, and it wasn't like an interview, it was more like he was being interrogated. It's like 
he wanted to find something out. And as he came up, my boss actually went up to him, and so I couldn't hear what they were saying. But he looked threatened, my boss did. And the guy, he was army guy, but he had sunglasses on, which I felt a bit strange. He had sunglasses on. And he was a solid guy about 40 years old. And uh, after my boss came back, all he said was, oh, the kids have said they've seen a flying saucer. And that's all he said. And then we finished loading up the trailer. We went back to the yard. Uh, I washed the carrots with the hose. And normally he would help me, but he left me with it. He went down to the owner of the paddock, uh, Robert Gulak, and he was down there for about an hour. And then he came back, but he never discussed anything with me. But I suggest, I suspect, he, Robert Gulak and my boss are the two guys that were seen on the tractor down there. That's what I suspect. Did you work for Marquesses? No, next door to Marquesses. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, <coughs> yeah so it's interesting. I, so I always sort of, you know, with, with your description of what you saw, uh, with it going translucent. Yeah. You know, one of my theories was maybe if you're underneath it, it might still have appeared as a as a as an object, and then from the side, maybe it's it started to do some sort of a camouflage. No, sort of and I've always felt uncomfortable because. Yeah. My description of it is so totally different from what the school yeah. saw. Yeah, yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting point. I think the, <coughs> phenomenon, the phenomenon can can uh, throw us uh, many things to puzzle about. Yeah, and I think that is one of the key. But I didn't feel threatened by it. No, it's something that just happened, mm. and um, there was nothing I could do about it. Mm. And I don't feel that I was harmed by it. Mm. And I don't feel uncomfortable going, I take my grandchildren to the Grange, they climb in the UFO and they have a yeah. wall down there. Yes. And I don't feel uncomfortable there. No. And even as a child when I used to go over there, yeah. it was a bit eerie because yeah. the trees at that time, the branches all touched the ground, it was this high with uh, pine needles, you know, <laughs> and you'd run through there and bounce on them. Yeah. It was so different. I tell you what, if you've not been to the Grange, you must go. It truly is a unique place, and it's, it's, we're lucky that it's still there. Yeah, yeah. you know, they they used to race uh, scramble bikes down there. They did. Oh, yes. wow. Yeah. Still, thank you. Thank you very much about that. Hello, <laughs> no, Marilyn. I think uh, it was worth it. <laughs> <laughs> Should really be on a T-shirt somewhere. Like, it's just one of those uh, one of those statements that uh, always brings a smile to my. Uh, my face every time I see it, so we will be very interested to hear your perspective. It was worth it, absolutely. <laughs> Thanks everybody for coming. I haven't um, been to any of the reunions over the years because of my work commitments, and I'm just gobsmacked at the interest. It's just amazing. Um, my story sort of runs along the same lines as jo uh, Joy and Terry, that I was in class at the time, as you saw on the documentary, um, and this person just ran into the classroom, not one of our uh, person from our class, um, threw us up against the door and said, there's a flying saucer in the oval. And everybody jumped up and you know, we had to run out and the teacher said, sit down, it's not break time yet. Uh, a few minutes later, you know, the bell went off and we just bolted, you know, out into the oval and saw this, I only saw one um, flying saucer and it appeared to have, was lifting off the oval. And then it just sort of hovered. And I remember, and I hadn't sort of recalled this, but people talking about sound, there was a humming sound, I remember, distinctly. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and it just took off. Uh, it didn't really disappear, but it just sort of went into the distance. Yeah. Um, my girlfriend and I ran to the end of the oval and climbed the fence and sat there. And we could see it in the distance, sort of going below um, the horizon and rising up again. Um, we just cried, we were terrified, we thought it was the end of the world. Um, seriously scary stuff, um, but from that day I believed that there was something out there um, and I truly believe that, you know, that hopefully in my lifetime, um, that you know, it's proven to be true.
because I, I truly believe. And I don't talk about, you know, I've seen a UFO to people. Occasionally it'll come up and it creates a huge amount of interest. Um, but, you know, I know people are sceptical, but I know what I saw. And I'm going to change my mind. And I too have taken my grandchildren to the Grange. Um, my daughters also, because, um, yeah, it's sort of like probably the only one in the film be. It's me, but my picture's there. And you would go. Thanks, everybody. Does anyone remember who the boy was who came running in? So no one I've heard his name or no, there's just a boy. Just the boy. A boy appeared. I was outside already. You were outside already. Yeah. I thought he might have been out there playing sport and he came rushing in, perhaps. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe? Yeah. yeah. Could have. Well that's probably yeah, probably was someone that was out there. So, no, someone who was who had to have been out there. Um, I can't recall anyone leaving the scene from where I was and I was out there. And you were, yeah, so there you go, that's right, you know, you know the teacher yeah. said. Unless they were in another classroom and seen it out the window or something, you yeah, don't know. Possible. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but as you see, like, you know, once, once something yep. out there, the genie's out of the bottle, everybody's going to go yeah. running. Yeah. And I'm sure Andrew Green, once you said, well, oh, let's go have a look, oh, I regret that decision. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, yeah, that's interesting. And it's interesting, you know, when we talk about the sound of the UFO, because you talk about it, you know, it's a soft humming, or was there a wind blowing at the time? Was it was, I can't recall wind. No, no. It was, uh, it's just like a, 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 a low drone sound. Yeah. Uh, you know, from it, um, I did, you know, like I heard the whoosh, you know, like that came across uh, from uh, when it first came over, and that's what attracted my attention. Yeah. So, and when it disappeared, it, yeah. Mm. Yeah. What I love about this is, is that, uh, there's a lot of cooperation here, you know, in the way that you guys are describing the objects, you know, the, the you know, traveling like this, turning like that, it, it kind of also corroborates the, the Deep Dean or the Baldwin photo where that thing is also on the side as well. Not entirely the same object if you've seen that photo. Yeah, I can assure you, no collusion. I haven't seen these guys for 50 years. <laughs> that's so, right. so, yeah. Yeah. So. yeah, that's right. So. You know, so that's... Oh, uh, still as gorgeous as ever. <laughs> <laughs> that's what you told me 50 years ago. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what happened? So, so what, I, what, I, what I'm curious about too also is, you know, like, I mean, you guys left the schoolyard, or some of you left the schoolyard, 66, they were pretty authoritarian back then. Like, that's a pretty major misdemeanor, I would have thought, to have jumped the fence and, you know, Paul says you guys were hesitating over by the things whether you're going to run over there or not. So... If you uh, knew um, Frank Sambleby, who was the uh, principal, he was an extreme disciplinarian. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, obviously you've heard the, the stories of detention. That's what uh, we, I was threatened with detention. Um, you know, that's why I stayed uh, exactly where I was. Yeah. Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, later in the day, uh, he, you know, we have been called in to, to sort and they tried to uh, restore um, some stability back into the school. That was not going to happen. Yeah. You know, like, uh, we were all in our groups and we were yak, 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 yak. <laughs> and uh, well, I think they gave up in the end. And <laughs> I'd be interested to hear um, you know, like, um, the stories of the next day. You know, because uh, mm. you know, you know, it's spoken of the uh, the guys in the suits yeah. you know, that came to school. That happened. That it did really happen. Really happened. These guys turned up in suits to the school yeah. the next day yeah. and started. Do you know they go to they target particular people or they go oh, to the they, classrooms? They or? collectively got us, you know, look, we're in an assembly. Yeah. And they, and, you know, they uh, effectively tried to uh, deflate what we'd actually seen uh, and, you know, virtually say, look, you, um, you forget that, uh, what you've actually seen. This is not hap um, has not happened. It's very interesting, um, and I remember Shane saying something to me, and I do remember it. It was just before Easter, mm -hmm. and we had uh, school holidays um, yep. yeah, tacked onto mm -hmm. that, and I think they hoped that, given that time span, that we'd come back to school and just settle yeah. back down. Yeah. 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 Were these Australians? Can you remember that oh, yeah, they well, were Australian yeah, sure. people coming in to tell you guys, look, yes. forget about this, nothing happened? You didn't look, see anything? No, uh, I, um, and I do remember, um, remember going past the office at the time and uh, when Jackie uh, Argent was, um, you know, she was uh, just going into the office uh, with those people and uh, 
you know, I, I, I thought nothing of it at the time, but uh, I've since seen the, uh, you know, the, the show and, um, and now I know what happened. Mm. Yeah, and mm. also the, the Tanya story, uh, I actually, um, I did pass the, uh, come past the ambulance. Amb- ambulance was parked in the, um, what, right up the back, near the canteen, beside yes, Sykes's yes, house. Now, yeah. the back was uh, facing the school, not from the roadside where the, um, you know, like any uh, outsiders could see it. And I actually saw um, Tanya in the, uh, in the back of the, um, you know, the ambulance. Somebody asked me, they said, uh, the, um, they said, you sure it was a girl? Two things I was interested in. in that <laughs> <laughs> One was sport, and the other was girls. girls. That was Tanya. <laughs> <laughs> um, probably another thing. I, look, I'm yes, sorry, I'm stealing right, the floor okay. from you. Um, you get the ca- uh, conjecture from uh, you know, people trying to discount you and, um, yes, and as uh, Joy said, yeah, yeah, what were you on at the time? Yes, we were uh, the age that we were and given the uh, disciplinarian of the, uh, the area, no, yeah, we, were, we were 12 and a half, 13 years old. Mm-hmm. And uh, um, somebody asked me the other day, they said, um, Do you, uh, are you r- religious? And things, and I've never, nobody had ever said that to me before. You know, like in regard to this, uh, look, I'm not atheist, mm. but considering what we've actually seen there, uh, I will, I'm convinced something's out there. So, uh, yeah. so you know, so religion, yeah, I suppose. Yeah, as I said, I'm not an atheist. No, but something's got to be out there. No, so. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. So, and so the next day, and you guys are obviously back in class again. Did any of the teaching staff? that point ever mention it again in any way, no. shape or form, none of the teaching staff said another word about it. No, no, not that I recall. No, not that no. no. And the other thing too about the um, being interviewed, interviewed by Channel 9, yep. it was outside the school yards. Mm-hmm. And yeah. we were, yeah, we did get detention from that, but in my mind, that was outside the school yard, so it sort of didn't count. So yeah. I thought that was a bit... Yeah, me too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Know, yeah. <laughs> Bad that they actually yeah. had detention for that. Yeah, that's right. Because yeah. I remember the school grounds. Yeah, because I remember yeah. when I was talking and, and the man in blue, and I, I assumed it was a policeman. I think, you know, yeah. that's what I saw of the uniform. And he put his hand on my left shoulder and he, he said to me, Now stop talking and you go back, go back inside the school grounds. Yeah. Yeah. And then he turned his back on me and said to the man who was filming the reporter, And you stop talking and stop filming and you go away. Yeah, and we did, you're yeah, right, yeah. Well, we were mm. definitely outside of school grounds. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just say something here? They actually put that on the air that night on mm. Channel right, 9 yeah. News, and it was uh, Eric Pierce introduced the news. I saw that news segment, and I remember the interview being cut off. In, in the yeah. Mm. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. That's how they put it to me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You remember that? Oh, I remember. Yeah. yeah. Can I just say something further? Um, the thing, from my point of view, something actually happened, and, and it, you know, we need to have some sort of uh, somebody to pop up and, and explain to us exactly what they were doing. I don't know whether they were it was from outer space. I mean, I, I don't deny that as a possibility. But, mm. but look, the the amount of trouble they've gone to to try and cover this up. Mm. Um, if it was just a weather balloon, they wouldn't be going through all this trouble. They wouldn't have these <coughs> these military guys going through, analysing the ground and then cutting the grass and destroying it. I mean, yeah. Excellent point, yeah. Kevin, that's right. You, you know, like if you're a bitch, uh, it's called a rubber weather balloon, is uh, not going to be of interest to, to anyone really, you know, realistically. So, how do you push the grass? Getting to that. Yeah. Yeah, that's correct, yes. Correct. Yeah, that's right. So we've had, you know, you look at the whole thing, you've had people that have been intimidated, you've had property taken, you've had evidence destroyed. So it it certainly cannot be some type of mundane explanation. The the sound factor, too, of uh, what we've, uh, what's been raised, that um, discounts a lot of the weather balloon. Absolutely, absolutely. Weather balloons don't go, <laughs> That's right. Yeah, and I think, you know, a 20-minute response time. A 20, you're talking 1966, which, you know, it almost seems like a 
It is. It's a long time ago. It's a long time ago. I might call it medieval times, but it's a long time ago. Fuck it. <laughs> it's a long time ago. So, it's a long time ago. Not that long. So, so a 20 minute response, would we get a 20 minute response today? <laughs> you know, you couldn't go drive through traffic today. Yeah. That's you know, to get there in 20 minutes. So, yeah, but it would already be online, wouldn't it? So well, it would be. Oh, you know, people, yeah. people, YouTube. YouTube, exactly. So back in the time there, you think, and, and I suppose also you've got to remember too that, that Westall Clayton in 66 was probably the outer of Melbourne. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's not Berwick or Pakenham. Yeah. Well, one thing from my UFO experiences in investigation, I can well and truly assure you that UFOs love quiet places. Yeah. So they, they appear in quiet places, and at that time, the school it's very rural. was very rural. Yeah, power line. The power lines. The power lines. They were attracted to the power lines. Yeah. So somebody, uh, and they're out there and, um, at the moment. I was talking to them just before. Um, raised the issue about um, yeah, the possibility of um, observation of children, because children do not offer a threat to True. anyone. It's worth consideration. Absolutely. Were they were they watching us? Um, like, uh, I think the, uh, the South African uh, yeah, situation yeah. was uh, was uh, yeah. sc school was yeah. kids. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, it's an interesting um, analogy, really. So. Maybe well, radar picked them up too before we actually saw them and contacted someone who came quickly there. So it might have been twenty minutes, it might have been forty minutes. That's, yeah, they could have had because those good aircraft point. from Moorabbin got there pretty quick too. So did someone else know about? Were they tracking them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and the system's not an F one eleven. Right? No, no. You, don't, you don't get those little babies up in the air. You know, I mean, and scramble the, the jet fighter. Yeah, and the major thing too, we were so used to the aircraft flying over all the time. That's why, you know, we knew what we looked was totally different. Yeah. You know, it wasn't a plane. You know. Every Sunday there used to be a Mustang fly over Clayton from Moorabbin Airport. So, yeah, we knew our aircraft. You knew your aircraft, absolutely, yeah. yeah. I'm not from Melbourne, but, but, you know, but yeah, you just got to hang around Moorabbin Airport for five minutes. To see, you know, you know, 20 different types of aircraft, and when you live in the area, I'm sure it's a everyday event. So something truly unusual that is silver, that has a humming noise to it, that can be silent, tilt, and then <laughs> off at 100 miles an hour is not a Mustang. No. So it's not a weather balloon. Uh, you know, so yeah. That, and it wasn't massively hysterical either. No, no. no. The, uh, <laughs> the speed that that, uh, you know, that the craft um, disappeared at was, you know, and I've heard Joy say this in the past, was uh, so much in excess uh, of anything around that time that could fly at that speed. And even then. Exactly. And, and then Paul said, like, you saw this thing on the scene, like a projection, and like, nothing like that could have been projected in 66, or they had to have anything that would, that would shoot off like that. I mean, we hadn't been to the moon yet. You know, this is this is before the moon. You know, like you know, we're, we're doing Mercury and and the other, you know, Gemini's and things like that. But in '66, we we hadn't really, you know, gotten that far. I mean, really, only just not that many years away from when Sputnik was put up there for the first time. So, you know, technologically, we weren't much more advanced at that time than World War Two, really. So, quick question too. Um, you you were up at Clayton North. Um, do you, do you remember approximately what time uh, did you actually saw that? Because I, I will tell you that uh, you know, like this happened around quarter past ten, ten half past ten you know, at Westall. Okay, so I, if that's the case, it would be more play. That would play make time. sense. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that, that absolutely makes and sense. And there was only one, I only saw one. Yeah. Do you uh, also remember doing any other kids? Seeing it at the primary school, like you and your you and your friends, or do you remember who any other children who saw it at the primary school? George said that there was another girl yeah. um, that saw it. She was on the playground, whereas I was not near the playground. Yeah, at the same yeah. school with your rat. Yeah. Yeah. On the oval, she was. Yeah. I've got a video of her giving her her description of what she saw. Yeah. And it was exactly the same description that you said. That was sort of in the sky, just sitting there. Maybe you thought she wouldn't be there, and off I went. But headed towards Westall. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. From South Clayton coming up to North Clayton and then doing a so called a big U turn mm -hmm. and going back down. Once again, a school. Mm. A school, yeah, a school, yeah. yeah. I always mentioned that point about them observing children. I think yeah. that is perhaps something that they do. And one thing you know about UFOs is they love water, 
you know, they're, they're always sucking up water somewhere. Uh, they love their power lines. They come up and get a little bit of a, a bit of charge. Maybe, who knows? You know, maybe they can, maybe they can, uh, you know, cook their toes or something. I don't know when they pass over and all that. But you know, these are these themes that are, that are coming out in this, in this, you know, from Westall certainly do play out in other UFO cases. So you guys are certainly not alone in the similarities that, that occur that occur in Victoria here, which has been a UFO hotbed over quite a long time. In fact, probably going back to Aboriginal times, I'm sure there's, there's been, they've been here for a very long time, whatever they are, wherever they come from. Well, the Dandenongs are supposedly UFO little hotbeds. Yeah, yeah be, like, obviously, uh, you know, like that Pakenham, Cranburn, through the Walton, Dandenong area is an incredibly busy UFO spot. It really is. We get many reports, I'm not going to digress too much, but we get many reports of the amber balls of light flying around Craneburn and Pound Road and all that. There's just some areas out there where you guys can probably go out tonight and see something, you know. So, yeah, so this this story is as uh, an important part to the overall Victorian world UFO, uh, you know, puzzle, puzzle, because that's exactly what it is. It still most certainly is a puzzle. So, how are we going to time, you? Two minutes. Two minutes? Yeah. Can I just say something? Yeah, sure. Um, not long ago, my work colleague, she Googled my name, and she said, oh, and she knows me quite well. She said, oh, you're crazy. <laughs> and I said, what? She said, oh, you saw a UFO. And I said, yes. And she said, and I said, so if you think I'm crazy, that means over 100 people are crazy too. And yeah. she shut up. Yeah. yeah. She's not said any more, and um, yeah. Yeah. Is, it, is it true this is uh, probably the yeah one of the largest uh, sightings sol- uh, in the southern hemisphere? Absolutely, yeah. And I mean daylight. Mm. Yeah. You know how often do UFOs rock up at you know half past ten in the morning? I think they got it wrong. Yeah, I think they got it wrong. I reckon they wanted to come down and power up, and they thought it was night instead of day. Yeah. Maybe, maybe they maybe they just come from the dark side of the earth. Yeah. The, the kids come out at quarter past ten. Yeah, there's research. That's why they come to observe the kids. Yeah, that's possible. Yeah, yeah. it's an that's an interesting observation. As I said, uh, um, this conjecture of um, schools and children. Yeah. Uh, it's. Uh, I think it's a lovely. What well, do you door think, Jude? Possibly so they mm-hmm. probably know the children. You're not armed, are you? Yeah. No, we are right. no, no threat. Yeah. Children aren't packing AK-47 on you, not. No. Um, <laughs> you know, so it's, it's not happening. So it's, it's quite, and there's, been, yes, there's, other, there's other school UFO cases around, even in Australia, there's, there's other primary school cases where, you know, they're not coming to mind, but I know there are other little, little talks from primary schools and schools around the place where every now and then something comes down for a bit of a look, mm. you know, and sees what's, uh, and sees what's going on. So that's, uh, that's really good. So, all right, well, I might call it now, um, so we have time to... Go and have another break. Mm-hmm. And we will be back for what is going to be a absolutely awesome Q and A session from you guys out there. I expect everyone to be to be up there with questions galore for for our panel here and for Shane or Rosie as well, if you like. I understand that there are some uh, t-shirts and DVDs out there if you are interested in perhaps getting a copy of the film. They probably will disappear fairly quickly as well. So, uh, what's the time for break? 20 minutes. 20 minutes. So we've been out for 20 minutes. Yes. And uh, thank you very much.
is an opportunity for, for everybody here, or as many people as we can humanly allow for, to, uh, to have the opportunity to ask questions directly of the of producers. So I'm really just going to sort of like facilitate that, like you know, like a traffic policeman type of thing. We'll do our best to get around, um, and again, we'll just apply the same principle that we'll try to keep our answers. Uh, you know, relatively succinct, I suppose, so we can get through more questions. So, you know, this is this is the the segment where, where you guys really have the opportunity to, to shine here and, uh, and ask some questions. And just before we start, I just want to also mention that uh, we have our panel up here of Westall witnesses and filmmakers and Shane, but there are also other people out here in the audience who were also there. At Westall on that day. So I want to say a special thank you and welcome to them for, for attending as well. And thank you very much. Yeah, because yeah, we said there's, there's 200 people that have seen this object, you know, that have come forward and, and we can't have a panel of 200 people. And it's great that there's other people here who, who have come along. Uh, who were also there on the day, and, and no doubt also getting a great deal out of hearing the panel speak. And can I encourage any, anyone who here is, who here is a Westall witness and wants to say something, and that's fine. If you have a question for the panel or corroboration, that's fine as well. So yeah, that's great, great people who are all here. And it's just fantastic that uh, you know, this event has been so well supported. It really is, it's, it blows all this way. So, so well done. Okay, so how it's going to work is we've got two roving mics out there. Uh, we've got Mike with a mic, and we've got Ron with a mic. <laughs> so, <Micron. laughs> so I've got a pretty bright light up here that you know, makes you barely be able to see faces. But, um, you know, we'll basically just, you know, if you've got a question, put your hand up. Um, we'll just try to make it as fair and equitable as we can. Uh, you know, I'll just say, you know, lady in the red, in the red hat or whatever, and the boys will run around uh, with the mics and, uh, and then when you got to the question, uh, again try to keep the question, you know, succinct I suppose, or as succinct as it can be. And uh, when you ask a question, maybe just stand up and say your name and uh, ask a question. How's that sound? Right. Reasonable? Yeah, good. <laughs> okay, so let's let the hands rise. Okay, I'll start off with you down here. Oh, so I just wait a minute, Jackie. Hello, I'm Jackie, and I'm very um, pleased to have come today. Um, I bought many tickets to go see Hollywood films about you were going to space, and today it was the best purchase uh, that I've made. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Woo! Thank you. Thank you. I've got two questions. My, the first question is I have two girls, and I'd like to share with them your story so it continues, because um, someone tried to. Um, shut you guys up down and with everything, so I'd like the story to continue. Um, how do you guys share the story with your grandkids and the next generation? Um, yeah. Okay, so we might get one, two, or maybe three answers. Well, you've got grandchildren. Okay, right. well, I've got four grandchildren, uh, and I just said one day we're going to go to the Grange, which is where Nana saw a UFO. What's a UFO? A flying saucer. Really? <laughs> <laughs> and took them to the grange where the playground is and showed them a picture of me when I was 14 and then I'm doing but that particular um, paper is there, that article is on a poster board there. Um, hence saying before that I was memorialised ever there. Um, yeah, and just, you know, they had a look around and played on their group and thought it was fabulous. Um, so, yeah, and of course I thought we were here about what's going on with this as well. So. Anyone else have something to add to that? Dee? Hi. Um, my daughter is a school teacher, 12 years of teaching, primary school and now in secondary school. And like I said before, I've spoken to her many, many times and she knows about today, but um, sometimes some of her students will challenge the UFO theory and, and she'll just tell them to Google West or UFO. Yeah. 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 Awesome, thank you. So uh, yeah, gentlemen, I'm next to you while we're in the same area. Hello, yeah. To the panel, my name's Don. Look, how Australia was back then, we were very much post-World War II governed in our thoughts and how the government controlled the country. 
with how things have changed in society itself, originally you would have had to stick to that cloak of secrecy, you saw nothing. How do you feel about telling people nowadays? Doesn't okay. Yeah. Does so, have you? Yeah. Um, I'm more than happy to talk about it now, but for many years I wasn't because people were very sceptical and I didn't want to come across as being, you know, something wrong with me. Um, but I find now that the young generation, um, I have a daughter, and she, I didn't tell her about it until just recently when I had contact with Shane, and she absolutely believes that there can be something else out there, and I think a lot of young people do. They've got much more open minds these days to things like that, and um, I don't have any problem with it now. Yeah, very good. Uh, now, gentleman in the hat there with the beer. G'day. Um, thanks for coming today. It's been good. Um, my question is for all of this. I'm just curious. Uh, days after the event, did any of you feel as though you were being followed or watched by, say, the mini uh, No. 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 Okay. But I think uh, just just to add to that, and there's something we raised before that um, yeah, you've got to think of the time when that, that actually happened. Uh, we were approaching at Easter that week, yeah. and then there were school holidays after uh, after that. And uh, I think the authorities, even the school uh, authorities, uh, hoped that um, things had settled down. And yeah. that's uh, that's how it really panned out. Yeah, we, we look when we got back to school, we, we were still in our various little groups, and we were talking about it amongst ourselves. But um, it was not a, not a lot to sort of made of. Yeah. 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 Do we have a comment in here? Yeah, that lady there. No, yeah. I just give it. No, it's okay. I was there. I was one of the students too. Yeah. It wasn't it? Gail. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Hey, Gail. Yeah. Um, yeah, I had the. Um, the, the, the volumes or the hover, and I think there was one other person from what um, Shane has said, hover over the house for a week in Clayton, and it would go down and it would go up really fast and then zigzag sideways and all these pretty coloured lights. They're very, very fast, and it did it for a week around that time that it happened at school. And you might jump the fence, and it's pretty much the story of all these people here. But I have got two questions if I'm allowed yeah. to ask two. Okay. I would like to ask. With the people that were there, because I've never known this, their headmistress had a breakdown. Oh, Mrs. They, Alexandra. They were screaming like a baby. Yeah, kid. Mrs. And Alexandra. The ambulance put, and she was all wrapped up in, in the yep. straight jacket and taken away. Yep. Did she have, she genuinely was, um, did she have a breakdown over what yep. happened? There? Um. What did we say? Well, it was pretty. I've, Close to something. Yeah. Told us, and I just yeah. wondered whether. It was yeah, there I think so. I think so. Yeah, because I remember that as clear as a bell too. Because okay. she was such a glamorous lady yeah. with the red lipstick yeah. and the she nails and the and, and, and the hair yeah. and the yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 that's right. They put her in the whole. Yeah, they wrapped her up in the straight jacket and took her out. Yeah, they did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the other thing that I would like to ask the panel or anybody else in the audience that were there, like myself, and witnessed the job defence and all other things. Have any of you since experienced an out-of-body experience since then, where you've actually gone up and had um, some like little extra terrestrial beings at a table and want you to join them, and then you've actually come back? It was just like the explanation of that um, flying saucer sort of disappearing and seeing like the ray burn and it was just like an out-of-body experience seeing that disappear. Have any of you experienced that on a personal level where they wanted you to go? No. No. Okay, no. Look, uh, Gail, Gail, yeah, just, just briefly, uh, uh, somebody else asked me a similar question of, uh, mm -hmm. you know, like anything that had followed up. Uh, once again, Gary Robertson and I, um, about, uh, about eight years later, uh, we were driving up Police Road, you know, pouring rain about seven o'clock at night. It was raining with me too. Sorry? It was raining with me. Years yeah, later. well, Gary and I uh, swore, you know, look, uh, I, I was in the passenger seat, Gary was driving, and we slammed the anchors on a, of this car. We swore that we'd run over somebody. Yeah, look, uh, uh, we, uh, that we thought that there was somebody uh, right in front of us, uh, uh, yeah, and that we'd hit that person. Pouring rain, we both hopped out the car and uh, said, um, did you see that? And both Gary and I did see it. There was nothing. 
So uh, that's as near as uh, that's as near as I've uh, I've come to. Okay. Okay. We're going to move on to the next question because we'll keep moving along. Uh, how did you the ladies first? Yeah. Uh, the ladies first. Yeah. My name is Helen. Um, I've got a question for the gentleman in the red jumper. Who, uh, yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> so this is this gentleman. Uh, Paul. Oh, Paul. Oh, Paul. Oh, Paul. Uh, when you said it was transparent, yeah. could you see anything in it, like as you're looking through? No, no. It was um, translucent beginning, started translucent, and then it just got uh, fainter and fainter till you could sort of see clouds on the other side of it. And there was nothing inside it, no. Mm. no. Very good. Okay. Um, now, any other questions from up the back at all? Okay. Just, uh, just a quickie um, to the filmmakers. Um, did Channel 9 have a mixed use for the film? Have you seen it at all? Or what would they say? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> That was, um, to be honest, that was a recreation of our experience. So that actually was not in the Channel 9 archive, but it's exactly what happened. So we discovered that they had a card, a catalogue card for, for fly source of the exact date, etc., etc., as, as you saw. And when they went to look for it, there was nothing there. So there was no explanation, there was no film there. I spent just countless hours trying to get them to track it down. I had them looking in piles of film that were all over the sort of Channel 9 headquarters. And what happened at Channel 9 when they were uh, renovating or build, uh, they were building a car park and they used a lot of their audio tapes and video tapes as landfill. So there was not much of a um, respect for archives back in the day and they were particularly interested in archiving material and they could make money out of it and they decided to ditch a whole lot of their videotapes their very valuable archive and you know shove them under the ground to fill out the car park so it may be there okay i'm going to go throw it over to you okay right at the very top there under the spotlight um, my question's for colin question for colin you seem to have had this vantage point. Um, would you think that perhaps they're observing children? And the quick response time would be that perhaps authorities might be going from school to school and perhaps doing a count on children and how many our population has, hence stay type or something. Um, yeah. Or yeah. how long did you do this? Yeah, I look, um, I think it's come up in conversation uh, before. And like, given the uh, the history, you know, with the South African um, you know, school with uh, with children and um, and uh, like other other instances, the North Clayton one uh, as well as Whistle, it, it just seems very interesting that um, that there were children involved in um, in all of, like in all of those instances. Uh, now. Were they observing us? I, I don't know. I probably never will know. But uh, it, it just seems a, an interesting uh, sidelight to um, you know, down to the story. Uh, the re you're talking of response times and, and the like. Uh, you know, it's a bit beyond my uh, beyond our control, really. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, you know, I, I, and and it, I'll probably get on to the uh, response from the uh, from the. Um, for the military and uh, and the um, authorities and what have you, it just seemed that it was uh, so very quick response that they had to. I, I just get the feeling that they had to know something. So anyway, I'll leave that. Oh, thanks very much. My name's Rick, and I just want to once again thank you so much for sharing your Sunday with us. Your story is absolutely fascinating, they really are. I've got a two prong question on my first of the panel, and it's about Tanya, um, and the second part will be to Shane. Um, I was a little bit confused. Terry, you were telling us how that you went down to the Grange and you saw her on the ground there, 
and, and then she was taken away by ambulance, but Colin told us that she was taken away from the school. Mm. I was just wondering if you could clarify exactly what happened there. And my question for Shane is, yeah. what were you able to discover about her fate? Were you able to find any health records, ambulance Victoria records, which uh, detail what happened to her after the incident? Mm. Well, I, I think she fainted. Sorry, I think she fainted. Um, and when she came to, I think her other her friend that was with her must have helped her back to the school. I can't really remember exactly. And then I just remember seeing the ambulance, and I wasn't even sure it was Tanya that was in it until you know a few of us hovered around and we realised it was her. But I didn't actually see her carried back or anything like that, so I'm not sure about that. I was too wrapped up, I think, in what I was seeing myself. <laughs> you know, it's really hard to take everything in when you see something like that. Okay, I'll just top, top that up, um, and it, look, it's interesting uh, sort of seeing um, you know, what some of these situations and uh, people deal with, uh, with situations a lot differently to others, and uh, I just get I got the impression that like, um, something has uh, distressed Tanya dramatically, and uh, she's obviously re uh, reacted. Um, and um, uh, the, you know, the ambulance required ambulance attention, and um, and that that's the last we actually uh, we saw of Tanya. Yeah. She was screaming. She was screaming. So yeah. she did come to. Yeah. She was screaming. So she was unconscious. She was. No, she was. She looked like she was when I got there, but yeah. she, when she wasn't, I don't know. But she looked like someone that had just passed out, and then she was screaming. Mm. So. It's yeah. quite hysterical. I was thinking in my head of being stunned or something like that, you know, but mm -hmm. that may not be accurate, but I don't know, it will pass across to Shane, but his response? So there were several students who were identified as being adversely affected by what happened at Westall that day. Several girls. Uh, Tanya was one of the students who was most commonly named. Some people can remember who it was. Um, every, uh, when we went to the school, Westall High School, we found these student record cards for uh, about half, maybe three quarters of the uh, students in 1966. We found a card for a girl called Tanya. There were only two um, Tanyas or Tanyas at the school that year, so um, And the card for Tanya had her had the information for when she started at the school, but nothing after that, which was at odds with every other student record card which had when they started, which primary school they came from, and when they left the high school. And if they went to another school after Westall High School, which school they went to. There was no information on the card like that for Tanya. Now I want to go to this side here. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's all right. Yeah, go on. Um, the other students who were uh, in relation to Tanya, um, you can't get hospital records people unless you are that person or you are a relative of that person. So we couldn't go down that path. The ambulance records aren't kept from that time. I went down that path with the ambulance service. Uh, just recently I've tried very hard to find perhaps the ambulance officers who went to Western High School that day. And um, we, we think we know which ambulance station they came from. Dandenong you know, Ambulance Station, the old one. I drove past it last night actually with uh, James from Bufoba. Um, and one of the ambulance officers <coughs> vaguely remembers a story like the Westall story, but nothing more than that. And it's possible that the ambulance officers involved are no longer alive. Uh, two or three other girls were identified as being affected badly by what happened at Westall. Uh, one of those I was able to track down. Uh, and unfortunately that girl received electroconvulsive therapy. As a teenager, not related to the Westall incident, but erased all of her memories from her teenage years. And she's now no longer really able to remember much about what happened at Westall. She can remember being there, she vaguely remembers the flying saucer incident, but not her role in it. One of the other girls who was named as having been affected, who went off and got medical treatment, and then came back to the school. I've never been able to track her down. I have her name. And the people who remember her being affected, they say when she came back, everybody was forbidden from talking about the incident, including this girl, Sue was her name. But she wouldn't talk about it, but she would draw pictures. 
about what she saw, because she was quite a good drawer, and she would show that to her friends. And when the Studio 10 program aired last year in April, another new witness came forward who had been so adversely affected by what she saw. She was in the sports ground at the time. She was so frightened by what she saw, she actually wet her pants. And she went home and she told her father about what had happened. And her father treated her so badly, but um, demanded that she not talk about it. Um, ended up breaking her arm. And in the end, without letting her father know, the school, which the high school, arranged for her to receive counselling with a school counsellor at a different school up the railway line. And they paid for that. And they put her on the train, and she'd go up there during school hours and come back again before the end of school, so that she, she could go home, and her father wouldn't know that it happened. And, uh, and that took more than um, 10 years for that witness to come out of the woodwork, if you like, and share that story with us. So, here's a little bit of an insight. Very good question. That's right, then. Good Any questions from over this side of the room? I'm trying to sort of go everywhere. Yes, down here, Mike. Maybe you just come around here with the mic. Mike and the mic. My name's Chris. I just want to know if there's any UFOs seen in Melbourne that day prior or after this is. Really want to know about it, I can't shed any light on it. Shane, it'd be the. Well, there's Were there other sightings in Melbourne area that day? Uh, on that day? Uh, yeah. Um, well, uh, Dee's talked about the sightings she saw at Clayton North State School, yeah. and there were reports of people along Clayton Road also seeing something. And there was a factory, the Robert Bosch factory in Santa Road, between Westville High School and Clayton North State School. And uh, a witness some years ago contacted us to say that she was at the factory that day. And she and some of our co workers had seen the flying saucer go past the window as it went north south down to Bristol. Um, in terms of other sightings on that day, uh, um, not so much. But there's been one or two. Uh, a couple of people have contacted me to say they remember the Bristol sighting happening and they had a sighting as well within that 24 hour, 48 hour period. Now, whether it was the same thing that happened at Westville, the same objects, in a way it seems likely. I mean, how many objects would there be coming from how many different places on one day to Melbourne? So you would think it's probably the same thing. So there have been a, a, a couple, a couple. Hmm. I, I'd like to add something about too, that a lot of those records have uh, probably disappeared now too. Um, from the old Victorian Flying Saucer Society. Um, their records have been scattered to the winds across the state. Some of us ended up in, in rubbish ships and, uh, you know, certain people have certain information. But, uh, yeah, that's, it gets harder to track some of, those other, some of those other stories. But, yeah, I'm sure they are out there too. Okay, any other questions at all? So, uh, look through. So, yeah, over here, we're long sitting too. There you go, Barry. The mic. <coughs> uh, my name is Barry. I'd like to make a statement and then I have a question for Shane. Thanks. Sure. Uh, my statement is that exactly a year after Westall, uh, the Crestview School in Upper Locker in Miami, Florida, had a four day visit from several <coughs> UFOs. It's not very well known in Australia, but it has been written up in the UFO literature. Mm -hmm. Four days. Yes. My question for Shane. Shane, I'm so grateful for all the work you've done and how you've kept given this situation real drive and punch and kept at it. Congratulations. Um, I seem to remember you had someone report to you that their father, who may have been a state a public servant who may have been able to give you some information that he died and his daughter was trying to be in touch with you. If that's vaguely true, could you put us in the right context, please, and let us know what you have established. Thank you.
imagination. It's gone past you. Well, I'm glad you mentioned the Crestview Elementary School sighting. That happened a year to the day after the Westall sighting. It happened on the 6th of April, 1967, uh, in the place that you mentioned. And it has so many parallels with the Westall story. It's uncanny, unbelievable, involving a science teacher, the first teacher to see it, his class of elementary primary school children. And it happened over about three days. The Air Force came to the school. The flying saucers were seen flying over a paddock on the other side of the street from the school in an open, grassy, sandy area. Uh, students remember seeing the flying saucers fly into the trees and disappear, and then fly out of the trees again. The trees didn't move. The flying saucer didn't change shape in and out. Uh, so there are lots of interesting parallels with that. And um, the Discovery Channel Canada was very uh, gracious and flew me over to Toronto to film an episode on that story. And I was interviewed for that, as well as a couple of other American investigators. And uh, they did a good job of, uh, of portraying that story. And I've been in contact over the last few years with quite a few of those witnesses from Crestview, both uh, students and teachers. The public server that you mentioned, so after the Westall 66 documentary aired, not that long afterwards, the daughter of a very high-ranking federal public servant who worked for a very large government department called the Department of Supply, which years later morphed into the Defence Science and Technology Organisation. Uh, she contacted uh, me and, and Rosie, really, to say thank you so much for making that documentary because my father was there that day and he had been sent there to Westall to investigate. And he was so affected by what he had seen that he was never the same again. And he tried very hard to get the uh, authorities, I guess, the government, to look at it seriously. But so much pressure was put on him by those who were above him. And he, you have to keep in mind, was the fourth highest ranking public servant in the Department of Supply. So he was very high ranking. There were very few people above him. But he put so much pressure on him to not talk about it, to keep quiet that she blamed his death, which happened uh, just four years later, in 1971, on what happened at Westall. And she was so grateful that the story was coming out into the public uh, marketplace, if you like. And her father initially talked to her about it. She was nine years old at the time. She had a brother, who I've also been in touch with, and he's confirmed similar details. And her father said to her, now, I've told you this now, and I'm not going to speak to you about it ever again. But not to talk to any of your schoolmates about it, but I talk to your teachers even. And she never did. However, she would discuss it uh, via her mother. And her mum and, and her would sometimes talk about it, and the effect it was having on her dad, uh, her mum's husband. And, um, and unfortunately, uh, he's now dead, the wife is now dead. And the son said to me that her, his father had a, a box of stuff, documents, secrets, and his uh, command, if you like, was that on his death, that, that box of secrets go into the fire. And so we think if there was anything kept about my school by him, it went into that fire. Possibly. So uh, that's that story. Uh, the daughter's still alive, the son's still alive. Uh, we are trying to get more information about the story from their viewpoint, from their vantage point. They don't want to talk about it very much. The daughter is married to a very high-ranking former naval officer. The son is a former Australian federal police officer and intelligence service officer. There's only so much to will say. Very good. Yeah, we've got some other questions up the back here. Uh, gentleman raising his hand, we're on the right on the spot. Um, just a question to the panel and to uh, Shane and Rosie. Um, now, Shane and Rosie, I read a story, and I'm not sure if this is accurate, whether it was uh, produced by the authorities to debunk the Westall story, but it would explain why the authorities were there so quickly. and 
what I read was that the US and the Australian military were conducting experiments, setting things up in the atmosphere to detect nuclear explosions. Um, and that, <coughs> according to the story, it was being conducted around the, the time the Western incident occurred. Um, hence, maybe it's explained why the authorities were there so quickly. I don't know if, what, if you come across that at all through your research and to the panel. Um, your stories are very consistent and fascinating. Um, what um, I find a little bit frustrating is the description of the object itself. Um, now, there was that photo taken um, on the second paper, I think. The, was it Born? Born, yeah. yeah. How different, and, and the panel described the object being on its side, and that photo was a classic example of that. So every time they um, tell the story, my, my mind goes back to that photo with the object on its side. How different is the shape of that object to the object that the panel saw? Well, it was a lot, it seemed to be a lot higher, I thought. Oh, sorry. It seemed to be a lot higher than what I remember it. It was the shape, shape, the actual shape. The actual shape of the object. Well, it was more like a bell to me, that photo yeah. in that magazine. Yeah. Yeah. What I saw was more like a flat no, no. disc, not no, nearly totally the same different. shape. It was different. Yeah, I think that the nearest one that, uh, that I actually saw, um, there was a guy by the name of Campbell um, put out, posted something that was as close as I've seen yeah. you know, to, to what, what is familiar to me. Mm -hmm. yes. So, um, what, uh, a Rod Campbell or, or somebody like that, but I, I saw a series of uh, photos um, you know, of various craft and what have you, and that was the nearest that I actually mm -hmm. saw it, you know, to what I saw. Mm -hmm. yeah. But yeah, look, it did, um, you know, obviously, yeah, it did turn up on, on its side. Um, yeah. well, I mean, I also sort of think that maybe these things can, you know, just throw it out there that, you know, maybe they can potentially shape shift. You know, like it's not. I'm not, I'm not trying to say that they're both the same object at all, but you know, we do need to be to be open-minded about. You know, we all saw what we saw. Paul saw something slightly different on the exact same day. Uh, the the Baldwin photo, while has some broad similarities, it's certainly located in time to the event. They might have different types, so I mean, well, we've got Porsches and Hummers. <laughs> you know, it could be a distant on the end day. Yeah, type them off, who knows? So I might pass to Shane for his comments. And just about the first part of your question. So the government program that we're referring to, I think, is the Highball program, which is the high altitude balloon program, as you said it was testing for residue, nuclear atomic residue from testing or explosions of devices in the atmosphere. A program that was run jointly by the Australian Department of Supply and the US Atomic Energy Commission. And uh, it was active at the time, and the, there is a researcher, a good con, um, colleague of mine called Keith Bassenfield, who works out of Adelaide. And he discovered that there had been a flight scheduled for the day before, the 5th of April, from Mildura. They were mostly launched from Mildura. Um, and he just wondered, he put it out there, is it possible that that flight was delayed, as sometimes they were, and happened later on the 5th of April or earlier on the 6th of April, and somehow made it all the way from Mildura down to Westall. Now, mostly those high ball balloons didn't make it that far. A lot of them didn't go very far at all. They deflated or they malfunctioned. But, of course, uh, it's a possibility. Now, the records for all of the flights were pretty much extant. They were found, but the records for that flight scheduled for the day before were never found. And uh, the records that they would have been put into at the National Archives are no longer in existence. They've been lost or thrown away. So it's most likely that we'll never find out. Now, while it's a possibility there may have been some connection, I, for one, uh, don't entertain it as a very good explanation because if you listen to the descriptions of the witnesses and what they saw and how the object behaved, it doesn't really correlate in any reasonable way with how you would expect a high altitude balloon's um, array because it was a balloon on top of a, um, a parachute and underneath the parachute would be the, um, the array or the gondola with the equipment. And nothing at West
Bristol was ever retrieved. There was a big response to what happened at Bristol, but not a single witness has ever come forward to say, we saw the authorities picking something up and taking something away. And it's hard to imagine how a equipment gondola crashing to the ground, and it would certainly just come down and crash, would leave a perfectly formed circle of grass. Uh, so there are those sort of dissonances, so it's very hard to entertain that as a plausible explanation. But as I said in my speech earlier, I think I did, I'm not committed to any particular uh, conclusion, any particular result, I just want the one that's right. And that doesn't seem to be the right one, but it's worth looking at every single possibility. I, I think it's, uh, it's important that people, you know, like obviously through, a, um, through this uh, forum here and uh, through our other various forum, uh, forums, we're ecstatic that, um, that people are actually talking about it. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. The more people that sort of get it out there, we might get that person come forward that, yeah. uh, that uh, has an answer for us. We would love an answer. Well, yeah, sorry, no, sorry, before we do, Kevin just wants to say that. I just wanted to say something further about um, going on from what um, Shane just said about this possibility of a high altitude balloon. Um, on the second day when, when I went down with my mate on, on the bike and we went down to the Grange to, to look at, um, at where, we'd seen, where I'd seen the circle on the, on the previous day, um, I'm not sure if I mentioned there were, there were military people on the field with with devices that looked to me at the time like Geiger counters or metal detectors and there was at least three or four of them doing that and they were very carefully going around examining the ground. Um, so to my mind, if it was a balloon, why on earth would they be exam examining the ground um, with, with, with devices like that? And then of course a week later when I went back and they removed all the grass and, and burnt the area of the circle. Uh, it just doesn't smack to me like something something that was a was a balloon in the air. But it certainly seems to me like they're trying to destroy evidence, something that we are not supposed to know about. Yeah, that's that's a very very fair comment. <coughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Well, everyone, thank you very much for uh, attending today. My name is Tony, and I'm one of the people from that flying school. It's, um, I met this too many people here from the primary school. Yeah, sure. uh, Which primary school, sorry? We're, we're still. That we're still primary yeah, school? Yeah, sure. Yeah. And, um, yeah, for years I've always wondered, um, my mum and I went back on the weekend, on the Saturday, to investigate when the uh, UFO came down in the grass. And we saw a, a young lady there, I still remember her screaming and carrying on, grabbing everything that she could like, get hold of because her parents are trying to drag her back to where this UFO comes down just to satisfy that there's nothing there but this girl just would not have it and I thank you for showing you maybe give me a bit of uh, insight of who it may have been but um, yeah the memories still linger on and just always look above there's always something out there Absolutely. <laughs> and what, what level were you at, uh, Tony, at, uh, at uh, primary school on, in 66? Oh. I think it was grade 5 and grade yeah. 4, grade 5. Yeah, yeah, but that's fine. But it just, um, it stuck with me for years. And I've told my grandson and now he looks to the sides and yeah. I've shown him the video, so I've got the video. Yeah, you're, you're like us, mate. Yeah, you're, you're very much like us. Yeah. So. All, all I can you know, um, I have found that you talk about it, people look at you rather strangely, but <laughs> I find nowadays that people come and ask you about it, mm. then I'll tell them. Yeah. So I've come across a couple of other people that have known things about it, but um, there's a lot of people that are interested that just won't come out and say anything. So if you know something, say something. Yeah, you're not in your own, mate. Yeah, uh, thank yeah. You. Absolutely. I hope, we've, yeah. I hope you've uh, yeah, gained you know, something you. from us too, mate. So, mm. okay. Yeah, we'll Tony's mentioned something. Uh, sure. Tony has highlighted something. Uh, the Westall State Primary School was adjacent to Westall High School, and um, of the 200 plus witnesses I've had contact with, about 40 were students at Westall State School. Um, the deputy principal of Bristol State School in 1966 came to our very first reunion back in 2006 and he told us of 
how he was out on an errand at the time the flying saucer incident happened, and he came back to the space school, and he'd never seen the children in such a state. He'd never seen the children so scared, so quiet, sitting huddled together, and they had witnessed this, as he later found out, this flying saucer incident. And after the Studio 10 program aired in April last year, a couple of days later, a lady contacted me to say she was the daughter of one of the teachers at Westall State School. And after the Westall 66 documentary aired a few years ago, her mum, the teacher from Westall State School, for the very first time in 40 years, told the story how she was there that day as a teacher. She'd never mentioned it to her husband or either of her two children. And she'd seen the flying saucer. She'd witnessed the reaction it caused amongst the students. And the next day, she told them. People in suits came to the staff room and said to the other teachers, if you talk about what you've seen, none of you will teach again in this state. This is to say, at Westall, this story is not to get out. And she obeyed, and she never even told her husband. And her husband was a police officer. He knew nothing about the Westall incident until she made this confession, if you like. Unfortunately, she had passed away. Um, but the daughter uh, checked again with her father, checked with her brother, and they confirmed the story that um, the mother had told them. So it's amazing how long people can keep secrets. That's a very, very good point. We have a question up the back there, Mike. Can you head up there? Hand raise. <laughs> Watch his knees. Thank you all for your time this afternoon. My name is Anne, and I guess um, obviously something very real happened in 1966. And I guess a question for the filmmaker, the researcher, and the engineer on the panel if there's been any thought about trying to reverse engineer the uh, object that was found or was seen to see if it could be recreated with today's advances in technology. Absolutely, and you look at the number of exoplanets that they keep on discovering, they're like mushrooms, they're popping up, 
out there in the, in the galaxy and beyond, and it's, I mean, it's pretty much clear most people, I think, that the universe is teeming with life. Um, I don't think there'd be too much doubt about that. Sure, none of us live close by, or not in our neighbourhood. Can I say something about that, please? Mm -hmm. Sure. Just something that also that really shocked the pants off me when I saw it. Um, the Hendricetti, Seth Shostek, was on TV um, about two years ago now, and he said that we now know that every, when you look at the sky, every one in five stars that you can see has a planetary system like ours, like a, a the solar system, with a very, very high likelihood of having at least one Earth-like planet in the Goldilocks zone, but it's not too hot, not too cold. Uh, and he said, we didn't know that a year ago when he said it on TV. So that's just talking about our Milky Way galaxy, which has got billions and billions of stars, that every one in five has a, has a planet's like a solar system. And they're now saying that. I was amazed that he was saying that. That's a complete change of attitude to the possibility of life out there. Yeah, I like to think of the Star Wars canteen scene. <laughs> yeah. Where they're all in there, in all different places, the books are playing, and you've got, you know, all the little angry guys that scurry a bunch from across the galaxy. It's part of the movie. It is, it is. And, you know, and it's, it may not be an unreality. I mean, you know, just because we are on the, the outer arm of a you know, the average galaxy doesn't mean that there's, there's fun parties going on elsewhere, uh, you know, into, into species interactions. So I see that my ring has a hand up, one of our organisers. You have a question? Yeah. Another two question. I just wanted to ask, firstly, can you hear me? The shape of the craft, how close the victor's drawing to what you saw? Good question. For me, nothing like it. Okay. You're talking about the bell shape? No, no Victor, Victor, which, which one are we talking about? Yeah, Victor's Victor. Okay, so Victor, which, which one are we talking about? Yeah, Has he captured it for you, do you think? Sorry? Has he captured it for you? I oh, would have thought it's slightly yeah. different, but it's very similar. Yeah, it's very similar. Slightly different. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, you look at a car crash and you've got witnesses and everyone describes something slightly different yeah. Yeah, as to what happened and what speed they were going and how many people were there. And it's just it's the nature of an investigation mm -hmm. that, you know, one of the things is, is that there's a lot of, there can be a lot of variety for the same experience. And on that note, um, what was the psychological effect do you think of this event? For yeah. me, none. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Laurie. Right. Right. It hasn't defined my life, it hasn't affected me in any way, I just believe I'm a soul. Yeah, yeah. 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 life, pretty much. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I know, I, I know it's there. It, it's just something that was so <coughs> exciting and just so memorable that it just doesn't leave. Some things are not as quite as clear and other things are like it happened yesterday. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say that because I was so young and couldn't share my story or know that other people had seen it, like I was very isolated with that. Mm -hmm. um, for my 20s, 30s, I had my children, I shared with them, I knew it was real, like what I saw. Mm -hmm. And until I saw the magazine and got in touch with Shane, that's when yeah, it was a relief. Mm -hmm. I could share it and, and it was true, it was tangible, other people had seen it. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, it was, it, it was a good thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. very good. Yeah, that's why I personally think that everyone here was privileged <laughs> who had the opportunity to, uh, to observe this these yep. objects on that particular day. Not too many of us perhaps get such a front row seat to... Maybe we're the chosen ones. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe it's like the cocoon. The cocoon, the camera movie. Absolutely, yeah, of course, George has said we're privileged to everybody here today. Uh, but everybody who's here today, audience, um, the panel, and Shane and Rosie, and, it's just magnificent. Now I'm going to put my hand up. Okay, Ron's got one. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Uh, I was just thinking, um, a lot of Ron no reports refer to craft as being like session beings. Is anyone subsequently thought of that, Eric, or is there any other witnesses? Thought of some craft as being a living entity, or, no. No. or is it actually phasing out instead of just lifting up into the sky? No. Yeah. Like with me, I thought it was an aeroplane, but it didn't have that tail, and then it just went around. So, I get that it's, everyone thinks it's a craft, is it? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Solid for me. Yeah. Were, were, we, were we scared? No. No. That's, that's an interesting point, you were not scared. No, no. Yeah. excited. It's good, yeah. Excited. Yeah. Keep on. Awesome. Yeah. Bring it on. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> so <silly>. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, Hi, my name is uh, Pamela. Just uh, one short question back to the uh, issue of uh, the lady who, the girl who painted. Has any of the affected students come close to the craft when it's been done? Terry did. Oh, yeah, yeah, yes. oh Terry did. Reasonably close, yeah. Mm -hmm. Within, oh, meters. Oh. Within meters, yeah. yeah. A few, few meters. It. I didn't touch it, no. no. Did Terry, did, um, Tanya. Tanya, I don't know, because she was already hysterical metres away from it when I got there. I imagine, don't think she did. Yeah, can you imagine metres from a, from a flying saucer, what that experience must be like? And just be metres away? I mean, awesome, exactly. It would be, it'd be beyond <laughs> words, I think. <laughs> so, any other questions out there? Oh, we've got hands waving. Come down the front here. I oh, so I can see it real clearly. <laughs> Uh, really, it's like staring into the UFO up here. Thanks. <coughs> um, just want to thanks for taking the time out of your uh, life schedules and, um, and share your experiences. And wow, well, this is what my little sounds like. <laughs> 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 um, I've actually got um, three questions. Um, one I think is for Terry, probably came close to. Uh, one of us. Um, did you uh, see anything, and I would imagine or assume that you've been to that path or range where all those palm trees were? Mm -hmm. Did you see anything um, uh, unfamiliar or strange about the trees themselves? On the day? Yeah, on the day. No. Okay. No. Oh. Um, the other question is, and I apologise if this comes across very as, as a sceptic, but I'm not sceptical, um, it's just that um, I have a very visual brain and I like to put timeline and special pictures in my mind as to how it happened. And I think my question is for Paul. Um, we were working out in the field at the time. Um, <coughs> were you wearing a watch and were you feeling it coming? I didn't own a watch at that time. I didn't own a camera. Sundial. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't have a lot. Okay, and, it's just, and the only reason why I asked um, if you were going with Pekka is because you said it was probably around 
Probably yeah, um, I sort time. of had a good idea of the time because it was about half an hour before lunch, okay. and uh, my we sort of knew how far, how much work we had to do before lunch. Yeah. Okay. And um, my other question, sorry, <laughs> uh, for Kevin, um, what kind of engineer are you, and are you, would you be able to provide some insights to um, some of the uh, if you're a structural engineer or Electrical engineer. I'm electrical. Okay. okay. Um, so, do you think that these parts actually operate uh, under, say, non nuclear or uh, combustible uh, fuels and more electrical, given the characteristics and behaviours of these parts? Oh. It's <laughs> <laughs> a bit technical. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I didn't actually see the craft, I saw the I saw the, um, uh, the circle in the grass. Um, I, I really can't can't comment on that. As I said before, to my mind, if they're crafted out from this world, um, they obviously be using some technology that's far beyond um, what we know at the moment. The only reason why I, I ask this is because, um, as you're probably aware, um, uh, England has um, electricity and it actually creates its own field. Um, and there are some okay. uh, devices out there that have I mean, that recharge. Yeah, I mean, it hasn't, it hasn't gone past my mind yeah. that, that it could have been a possibility yeah. um, that these craft could be sucking up energy from the power line. I mean, I, yeah. I, I, you yeah. know, I don't, I don't cancel it as a possibility. But again, I think the point is you must keep an open mind. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think, uh, you know, the humming, you know, might be, so humming might be connected to electricity, but that could be completely wrong too. It's, we're all really, you know, at sea with this, I suppose. There's a question over here. The gentleman with the hand raised in here, Mike. Mike with the mic. Oh, hi. My name's Brett. Um, and look, thank you all, and especially to Shane, you've done an enormous amount of work here. But um, I'm just, I think it's terribly, you know, you said you were metres away from the craft. Um, in relation to your own height, how high would it have been? Would it, have been? it was raised up. It was raised slightly off the ground when I got there. Um, it wasn't. It didn't appear to be very tall. Um, I'd say maybe from the ground, a couple of metres at the most. At the most yeah, it didn't seem to be. Well, say from the ground where I'm sitting, I suppose. Yeah. That, that height? That's not very high. Yeah, it went up slightly in the middle a little bit, so I, it, was, it was fairly shallow, really. And which leads me to think that, did you have any thoughts about, not that you would necessarily know, about whether the college was occupied or whether it was a drone type thing? Uh, look, in my mind, I probably thought there was someone in it, to be honest, because, you know, he brought up the thing that aeroplanes have to have someone flying them, so I, I probably always thought there was someone in it, but I certainly didn't see anyone, and I don't remember any windows, I just remember the lights around underneath it, because it was already raised up a bit when I got there, um, but no, I didn't see anybody, but I would think that there was probably someone in it, but mm. who knows. Was it a nice clear light, like an LED light? Or oh, look, it was so hard to remember exactly. They yeah. were a bluey colour, that's all I can remember. Bluey purpley sort of colour. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Up uh, the back, yeah. Yeah. Just one just wanted to ask, um, what was the fate of the teachers and Mr Greenwood?
and he wanted to get away from West Ohio because he was tagged as being the flying saucer teacher. And that reputation followed him to his new school. Um, and there were kids who would come up to him from time to time and say, Mr. Greenwood, I knew Mr. Greenwood had taught at the Flying Saucer School. So things like that happened. Um, Mr. Greenwood's still alive. He's retired now. He's farming a property in rural Victoria. He expressed interest in coming today, but unfortunately, just in fitting with his schedule. Um, so he's alive, he's well, and he remembers the story vividly. And his primary interest, and he said this in an email to me just a week ago, he's not so much interested in the UFO aspect of the UFO, he's interested in why the government responded in the way they did. Why did they come around to his home, bang on the door, he opened it, he thought they were coming around to interview him about what he had seen, they were coming around to put the hard word on him and threaten him. And he remembers, he said this to me when I spoke to him on the phone, more than the vivid memory of seeing the flying saucer, the memory of these two Air Force officers trying to pull the wool over my eyes. At once they were trying to say, flying saucers don't exist, and you're not to talk about it. And he remembers thinking, for a moment, if flying saucers don't exist, what does it matter to you if I say I saw one? So uh, he was angry, and he was upset, and uh, that still lives with him today. He wants to know why the government treated him and the students and the school and the store in the way that they did. He did ask us to send his regards to his former students. He <laughs> <laughs> did. He asked on his regards to his former students. Is he still got the MG? <laughs> yeah. That's right. Has he still got the MG? Thank you very much. My name is Dale. I'm with the Aviation Historical Society of Australia. So we met before uh, Rosie um, and Shane. And um, my question is this sort of two-part question. Uh, but first, as I need to say, this is what I've got the mic. Um, it's, it's really good that the guys who come here today and talk about their experiences because uh, my, my mother was certainly um, a witness to this. So she was uh, working at Rock Bosch and it was hard for her to talk about it. She mentioned it to me probably 10 years after the event and we discussed it again in 2006, I think, when this was all happening. And she spoke to Rosie. Um, but she wouldn't talk about it for fear of ridicule. Um, you know, she came from that era. Um, so it's good that you've come forward and uh, speak in that regard. And my two questions uh, basically come down to the conspiracy theory in a way. The first one is, um, to the, uh, I'll, I'll just say them now. One's to the um, uh, witnesses. Did you remember, you were talking about planes flying over at the time. Um, do you remember aeroplanes, the numbers of aeroplanes, heights, were they, why were they noticeable? Were they flying lower than usual? Was there a cloud of planes or one or two that were more than you might have usually seen? And the other question will be to the researchers, I guess, is um, shown in nine figures a number of times in this, and including, I think, in the paddock. Um, if I remember correctly, I might be wrong there, but um, has anyone spoken to any camera people or tried to chase up the cameraman? The camera people were at the time when the interview was. Thank you. Yeah, I think there was five. Two, about five. Five planes. No, more than normal, because there was yeah. always a lot of yeah. light aircraft. Flying around, and they were always way. visible. Because yeah, it sort of was. But this day, it seemed to be more, and they were just they seemed to be hovering, or not hovering, as in like sort of a few of those. Yeah, a lot more. Yes. Certainly around. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Interesting to why you send assessments to chase after UFOs, isn't it? Think if you're scrambling a, you know, a sailor jet or something to go out there and. Chase them. Why do you send up little, little slow assessments? Gravity airports only three k's away. That's right. Yeah. yeah. I'm not even sure. We were the F triple ones around then, because uh, I know the training uh, craft they had around the time we were, we were away. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, but there were vampires around too, around that period. I'm not so sure that the uh, F triple ones were around. I, I don't know. I can't remember. Oh, was Sorry. Just sorry, at the same that stage, the uh, RAAF, uh, we did have the remains of vampires in service, yeah. but we mainly had our 86 sabers. 
Yes, just across the shop, the uh, gentleman's question. Uh, what those, uh, if they have a question. Aircraft, by the way, the people who report them as being like Cessnas, or, or possibly Kuipers, the sort of aircraft that people were familiar seeing from the Raven. And there was some, there was some story that maybe those planes had come from the Royal Aero Club of Victoria, which was and still is headquartered in the Raven. Um, no one knows. But the aircraft didn't look like military aircraft. They weren't uh, grey or silver. They didn't have any military markings. They looked like civilian aircraft. We don't know. Uh, in relation to Channel 9, we were able to track down the original journalist, Gordon Lee, who had covered the story, and, and before he passed away. The cameraman, unfortunately, um, Keith Bella, had already passed away at that point. But Gordon remembered the story very clearly. He remembered covering the story. There were lots of flying sources of stories around that era, uh, but he remembered the first one so clearly because it was so unusual. It was broad daylight, hundreds of witnesses, uh, the response of the authorities. Uh, in relation to the Channel 9 film going missing, he didn't think that was particularly unusual because the film got lost, it got recycled, it got thrown out. So he didn't read anything necessarily conspiratorial into it. Uh, but it was good to be able to speak to him and to hear his memory of being there that day and to say with him while she is. Looking for the smoking gun, have you analysed the soil for any radioactivity or any type of radioactivity in recent um, years? Couldn't quite see where that question was coming from. Where the uh, craft landed. Okay. Oh, where the, there is it? Oh, sorry. Where, oh, the, yeah, yeah. Okay. where the craft landed or it's left like a crop circle almost for that. The soil will be contaminated. Has it been tested? And even recently. So we thought about doing that um, as part of the film, didn't we, Rosie? Um, was it like a honey? Budget. Part of the issue was not being able to be one hundred percent sure where the circle or circles were, and we still aren't one hundred percent sure. I'm relatively sure that I've narrowed it down to at least three different places that seem to be fairly uh, likely to have been the location of the circles. Um, unfortunately, for two of those locations, they're now covered in either asphalt, a street, or Brady Avenue next to the school, um, or housing immediately south of the Western schools. The other location, uh, one or two locations, is at the Grange, and next to the Grange, unfortunately, the one next to the Grange is now the Clayton South landfill. Um, so that's out of question. Possibly, if there was radioactivity associated with whatever this was. Yeah. So we thought about that, Rosie, didn't we? We did think about it, but it, it was so difficult to actually decide which location might be the most likely. Um, as Shane's saying, there were so many changes in the area. Um, Could be smoking around. Sure, we have a bit, but I guess, yeah, it seemed like a long shot, put it that way. The climb of tree that Paul remembers the object flying into, very fortunately still stands there today, minus one tree which fell down a week ago. Um, don't blame Paul for that, please. <laughs> Nothing to do with Paul. Um, that climb of tree still exists. Um, and some people, George has mentioned in the past, I remember, other people have mentioned possibly doing some sort of testing on those trees. Um, I guess that remains a possibility, but I don't know. Okay, well that's pretty much for us to uh, the conclusion, but if there's any last minute questions, there will be an opportunity out here to have a chat to the witnesses uh, directly for the one on one, if you would like to do so. Uh, so I'd like to say, you know, certainly it's been a big day. We've all had to, to take in quite a lot. Oh, yeah. um, and you know, there's obviously a few, you know, a few people that we'd like to thank. And first and foremost, I would like to thank both Jim and Irene, who put in an awful amount of hours and time to, to get this together. I think you We uh, know what it takes to organise these events and it takes a lot. So Andrew and I 
aware that we didn't have to do too much for ourselves this time. Obviously, thanks to Shane and Rosie um, for all their work. You know, it's, it's, it's brought the story back out again. Uh, and I think we're all going to be talking about it for a long time to come. And that's, that is, as people have said on the panel, that's a great thing that, that we're going to be talking about this all for, for a lot longer. And I'd like to thank the panel. Thank you, thank you very much to, to the witnesses. I mean, you know, this is, this is a, a, you know, it's a big story and you, know, you guys have been through a fair bit over the years. So for everyone who was not there on that day, uh, your tellings of the and recreate, recounting of what you experienced has certainly brought it back to life uh, for those of us who weren't there and, and for that we're all very grateful. Um, I'd like to thank George as well also for, for doing the interview. Thank you. I'd like to thank the new fellow guys who manned doors, sold stuff, yeah, the, the troopers have been out there doing things, that's, that's always needed. Um, if you're interested in UFOs and you'd like to, to do more, you can always have a look at our website, ufo.com. Uh, our, our YouTube channel is alive, ufo TV, so have a look at that as well. I'd like to thank Lana, who's done a great job of keeping the same track as well. So, and Andrew at the back is filming it. And look, Anyone else who's had anything to do with the day, really, uh, you know, thank you. And, and most, and, most and foremost, thank you to the guys, you guys who, who come along. You know, it shows that the interest in UFOs is strong here in Melbourne, Victoria. Uh, there's lots of events in Sydney and Brisbane, and you know, they've got quite a strong scene up there. But it's really fantastic to see people prepared to come along, support these guys, support the film, uh, support the research. You know, this is an unfunded thing, like no one pays your money to do this. Uh, so, you know, your contribution helps us to do what we do to, to investigate further because the authorities are not going to help us. So thanks very much everyone. There will, you can grab a drink out there um, at the bars. At the bar will have drinks at bar prices if you'd like to hang around. If you need to catch a, um, a bus or something, that's okay too, sorry. Yeah, I've been I've, I've patient about this question. <laughs> from several fronts, but just to conclude, put your hands up if you've seen a UFO. Oh, there's lots to talk about, isn't there? Yeah. So, thank you everyone, I look forward to seeing you outside. Well, while we're at it, if, um, if anyone's interested, uh, I'm going back on the 6th of uh, April to uh, stand in the same spot that I did so if anyone's here on uh, at West Hall High on uh, the 6th, come and see me. Oh, okay. Uh, Colin's just had an offer that uh, he's going out to West Hall on the 6th of the 6th and he's going to stand at the spot where he was. So if there's any keen punters out there who'd like to go and stand in the same location. Providing the principal lets me. Oh, providing the principal lets me? That's in four days. Then yeah. that's not possible. Yeah. That's, oh, that's about, about 10, 15. I've got to work on this, so I can't. What's around about 10, 15, 10, 15? Oh, 10, 15, 10, 30 on the 6th. The group's going out to there with Colin. And 